Note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizzela Kate. This is Grizzly True Crime. Today we're going to be discussing the Idaho case. We haven't discussed this case for a while. If you've never heard of this Idaho 4 case, as people know it on social media, then, sorry I'm going transparent there, <laughs> then please check out the playlist that I've linked for you in the description box. Okay, we've done lots of coverage on this case. There have been quite a few documents and hearings and everything in this case, just like Delphi, you know, lots of documents, mountains of and this hearing is actually one that sounds quite interesting. <laughs> so, welcome everyone. Welcome to all my moderators, to my patrons, members, subscribers, anyone who's new here, any locals as well. Welcome to you. And a special thank you to MB Inc. I've linked his channel in the description box because MB Inc. streams all of these Coburg hearings and many other trials and all sorts of things, press conferences. And then he, let, <laughs> he lets me know with these Coburg ones if it was spicy, if it was interesting or not. This one, he said, was like box office. It was very interesting to watch. Um, so I did also check it out. And then I thought, you know what? We need to watch this together. Yes. So this is going to be a just a quick uh, rundown of what was going on. Okay. And then we'll watch the hearing together. So, and I might play it on like, you know, 1.1 speed for us or something like that. How about that? Okay. So this says... Latar County, Idaho, a judge is expected to rule on whether Brian Koberger's defense can continue its survey. So it's a spicy survey. That's why I say that on the thumbnail because like the survey is causing uh, big arguments between the state and the defense, of course. Okay. Can the defense continue its survey of prospective jurors by asking nine case specific questions, including two of which contain false information about the defendant? The defense is seeking to move the trial out of Latar County, where four University of Idaho students were murdered and where Koberger's attorney say he cannot get a fair trial. Lawyers met Wednesday to argue whether the survey violates the, uh, the court's non-dissemination order that has kept much of the evidence under seal and prohibited either side from making statements about the case outside of the courtroom. Is MB Inc. here? I see everyone saying hi. Hello to MB Inc. If you are here, thank you so much for being here as well and letting us know that this hearing was very interesting. So they say uh, Koberger's defense team contacted trial consultant and change of venue expert Brian Edelman. So another Brian. <laughs> There's another Brian in the courtroom. Brian Edelman to conduct a survey of 400 residents in Latar County to determine the impact of pretrial publicity on the community. I think it's very interesting to do that, actually. Let me know what you think. Edelman testified that Nine case-specific questions, including two that contain false information, are necessary to ferret out bias. Edelman says the questions were based on information gleaned from the public record and media accounts. His analysis of the data suggests that the more someone knows about Koberger's case, the more likely they are to opine that he's guilty. He also told the court that posing questions that contain false information is necessary to determine what information, what misinformation is prejudicial. Okay, among nine case-specific questions, and we're going to look at them now, then we're going to dive into the hearing. Among nine case-specific questions that are being asked of prospective jurors is, have you read, seen, or heard that Brian Kober stalked one of the victims? Both sides agree that the statement is false. You know, they've never said definitively that Brian Koberger, well, when I, when I mean, I mean they, when I'm saying, when we look at documents, you know, and follow what law enforcement is saying, they didn't say, right? But I know that out there in the media, it has been widely <laughs> stated that Koberger definitely stalked at least one of the victims on Instagram, right? Or somewhere on social media. Well, now they're saying that's false. And it sparked objections from Latar County Prosecutor Bill Thompson. He got very heated. Okay, he was getting snark he had his snarky pants on that the case specific questions are potentially tainting the jury pool and violating the non-dissemination order. The judge ordered a halt to the survey until he could examine the issue more thoroughly. 
The judge appeared to be concerned about the two questions that contained false information that he stated did not come from public record. Defense attorneys argued against forcing Edelman to change his methodology and sought to continue the survey of two uh, more counties using, using the same set of questions. The defense said a comparative analysis is warranted to allow the judge to determine whether venue change is warranted and where else the trial could possibly be held. Our defense team firmly, firmly believes in Brian Koberger's innocence, and right now he will be tried in a county that believes he's guilty, said attorney Alyssa Massoth. Data from Lato County shows that there's a presumption of, there is a presumptive of prejudice, and you will not have comparative surveys to fully inform the court. <laughs> Janet says, I'm now selling snarky pants. Is it? <laughs> The judge did not immediately issue a ruling, but agreed to move the change of venue motion to June 27th. Oh my goodness. Like this, whew, this, this, the wheels of justice are turning very slowly in this case. You know, that's why sometimes I'll say, is the trial going to be in 2052? And actually, I did uh, defluff <laughs> this hearing for you. So we're not going to listen to the first 20 minutes or so. So if you want to go listen to the whole hearing, it's definitely out there. MB Inc. streamed the whole hearing. Of course, mainstream media streamed the whole hearing. The first 20 minutes, the reason I, I you know, defluffed it, I abbreviated this for you, is because when I watched it, I got I got a little bit, I lost, I lost focus. I got a little bit bored in the first 20 minutes. I was like, what is this about even? But then it gets way more interesting. So we're going to dive into the interesting. I'm summarizing what they said there in the beginning, right? But in the beginning there, the one comment that Ann Taylor made was, judge, at this rate, we might never get to trial. And I'm like, oh, dear. I think that was, that was true. 2052, maybe. Now, here's the, so the next court date to put in your diary, okay? As you know, over here, <laughs> we write it down in our paper diaries, okay? <laughs> so you don't have to. We just, many of us do. When last time I said it, people are like, I do it too. Okay, so Brian Koberger defense survey questions were, one, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger was arrested at his parents' home in Pennsylvania? Listen, Grizzlies, pop quiz time. Have you? <laughs> okay, two, have you read, seen, or heard if police found a knife sheath on the bed next to one of the victims? Three, have you read, seen, or heard the DNA found on the knife sheath was later matched to Brian Koberger? Four, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger owned the same type of car reported on the video driving in the neighborhood while the, where the killings occurred? Five, have you read, seen, or heard if the cell phone tower data showed that Brian Koberger made several trips near the victim's home in the month before the killing? Six, have you read, seen, or heard if the university students in Moscow and their parents lived in fear until Brian Koberger was arrested for the murders. Seven, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger said he was out driving alone on the night of the murders? You know, his alibi. His alibi is like, what? I like taking drives at night. Okay. It's long drives. <laughs> okay. It could be. Yeah, you never know. He is innocent until proven guilty. So they said, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger followed one of the victims on social media? Okay, yeah, so Jennifer Fox says, very leading. What do you think of these questions, right? So, uh, also, don't give spoilers. I know this hearing happened yesterday. This hearing, just to clarify, took place yesterday. I'll put a banner on the screen when we're actually listening to it so that uh, that you know, okay? So if there's any smarty pants <laughs> that come in here, let them know we have our snarky pants on and we are not going to, we just want to watch it together, okay? <laughs> so, so... Those are the questions. I do think it could be quite, the questions are quite, those are leading questions, right? Because now if they didn't know, now they're going to know. You know what I mean? The people who didn't know about this, well, now they're going to be like, huh, well, let me go and read up on it. So, <laughs> so now they kind of have to change the venue, in my opinion. But the judge has to, of course, decide. And of course, they're going to have that change of venue motion on June 27th. All right. So now let me fetch... Uh, let me fetch the video for you. Hold on one second, and I'm going to have to resize it quickly. Okay, so here we go. And again, it's uh, like deja vu of the <laughs> the Daybell trial, because it's again a, a bit of a Zoom view, okay? We're looking at Zoom. Damn, Zoom is popular these days, huh? <laughs> Zoom is like, it's me again. Hello, everyone. But thankfully, MB Inc. streamed this and captured it for us without putting a big logo over here so that we can't see the whole presentation. Because that's that kind of annoying, right? When we can't see the presentation. We want to see the presentation time, clearly. So thank you, MB Inc. Really appreciated that this was captured so that we can watch it, okay, together. 
see the whole presentation that the expert has, and that's where we are now, okay? I've, as I said, the first 20 minutes, go watch it on the original streams. I've linked MB Inc.'s channel below. He's got the whole stream there. We're now diving right into where the defense expert takes the stand, and we're going to see his presentation. Are we ready, everyone? Here we go. Okay, wait. No, there. So, um, are you ready to call your witness? I think you are. I am. I'm ready to call Dr. Brian Edelman. Okay, Dr. Edelman, if you could please come forward, face the clerk, raise your right hand. Here we go. You solemnly swear that the testimony you give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury. I do. All right. Thank you, sir. If you could please uh, if, take your seat there. And then once you're comfortable, please state your name and spell your last. It's Brian Edelman, B-R-Y-A-N-E-D-E-L-M-A-N. Thank you. So I'm playing it at 1.1 speed. Let me know if it's too fast and I can change it again. Um, CH said it's ironic that Bill, which is the prosecutor, read the nine questions into the public record last week, making them exempt from the NDO, yet he still has tantrums over them being talked about. I love hearing all your opinions on these cases, on all the cases we discuss. Of course, that's why we're here. That's why we live. So thank you for being here. Please like and share so that others know we're here. I know there's a lot of true crime news today, lots of things happening. So I'm really grateful that you are here with me today looking at this. Good afternoon, Dr. Elman. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? Um, I work as a trial consultant and also I do quite a bit of um, work as an expert witness in the field of pretrial publicity and change events. Are those two separate roles? Yes, they are. What do you do when you're a trial consultant? So as a trial consultant, you're an, an advocate for your client. Uh, you do mock trials, focus groups, um, to really try to develop a trial strategy, a trial story for your, for your side and cultivate that for the audience, the jury. Um, we also do jury selection. I assist with writing voir dire questions, juror questionnaires, um, help figure out bias during voir dire, um, recommend cause challenges and how we use peremptories. do post-trial interviews. I do um, jury-related research, present my findings at uh, conferences, bar associations, law firms, and so on. When you work as an expert in the field of change of venue, does that differ from your work as a trial consultant? Absolutely. How so? Well, as I mentioned, as a trial... Sorry, they don't... Um show his face okay they don't show him we're gonna look look at this for a bit we're gonna listen and i'll get uh, maybe a picture or two so we can look at things i know we're visual learners but listen and then we'll see we'll see more of the court uh, later so you're retained to be an, ex an advocate as an expert you're retained to be an objective expert which means i'm not advocating for either side i do not advocate for the defense i do not advocate for the prosecution my role is to collect information using standard methods that have been widely accepted in the field, and then present the findings to the court so they can make a well-informed decision on whether or not any remedial measures are necessary. So there are times where my findings support what uh, remedial measures, like a change of venue, and there are times they don't. And when they don't, I recommend against a change of venue, whatever the data supports where, where I go. I want to understand a little bit about your educational background that allows you to do that work. Okay. How were you educated? I'm sorry? How were you educated? What degree? Um, starting in grammar school. Uh, <laughs> we, can, we can skip to college. Yeah. Um, so I have a bachelor's degree in psychology from Florida State University. Um, from there, I attended the University of Nevada in Reno, um, where I studied social psychology. Uh, my particular interest was in the application of social psychology in the field of, of the legal arena. Yeah. Um, so I was really interested in juror decision-making, jury decision-making, group dynamics, how people process information and evidence, the impact on pre-trial publicity, pre-existing attitudes, and that sort of thing. Um, the school I went to really focused on that on that area. That's where the National Judicial College is, um, the Grant Sawyer Center for Justice Studies, and several professors in that field. So um, I conducted research at the Grant Sawyer Center um, for Justice Studies. Um, I helped run a program through the Department of State that brought in judges and attorneys to the United States where they would travel around the country and meet with people in their field. So I worked with the National Judicial College in that regard as well. Uh, oh, and then from there, when I finished my PhD, um, I got a Rotary scholarship to study in the United Kingdom, where I got an LLM in international humanitarian law, which I do not use. 
during the course of your career have you been published? I have. Um, I've been published in this area of survey methodology. Um, uh, my research was on the death penalty, so I have a book published on the death penalty. I am the co-editor in California. The, there's something called the CEB, the Continuing Education of the Bar. And there's a criminal procedure book that comes out every year. It's kind of like the Bible for criminal procedure. And I'm a co-editor on the chapter on change of venue. Um, I was also on the committee for the American Society of Trial Consultants that um, publishes professional guidelines for writing um, uh, change of venue surveys. So on that, um, and I've also done research on one of the questions is always, well, why can't we just pick a jury in a high profile case? We're going to look at the presentation after they've, you know, after we've heard all of this, you know, what the server is and what he's doing and how he's a, this um, expert. OK, so just listen to that. And then we're going to watch his presentation. I'm putting so I'm going to put some pictures up here to, to keep us entertained while we listen. OK, because many of us are visual learners. So I've done research on um, the uh, use of the set aside question. So if people have been inundated with a lot of prejudicial media coverage, um, how do they respond to that set aside question? Do we see, for example, if somebody's been exposed to a lot of prejudicial coverage, you'd expect them to say, I cannot be fair and impartial. I know too much. And so we were looking at research on that as well. And then the last thing I promise is um, I've, I've also done research on what's called minimization language. So when you ask people an open-ended question on a juror questionnaire or in voir dire in a high-profile case, this is the only standard question, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? That's the open-ended question. And people minimize what they know. That's something Dr. Ed Bronson came up with because he had noticed it. And that's like using language such as, I only recall what I what was in the paper, or I just followed it. Um, I just remember it was on the news. And they don't really elicit a lot of information. It's minimized knowledge. So it's been research on that. Too. That's been part of your research? Yes. Okay. When you work as an expert, in a, if you're hired as an expert to work on a change of view issue, and I think you told us how your work is different than when you're a trial consultant. Can you tell me how you start in that role as an expert for change of venue? Yeah. So I've been, first of all, I've been doing this for about 15 years, I'd say, as an expert witness on this area. On change of venue, on specifically? Change of venue. Okay. And, and to do with surveys, just to be yes, there? Yes. From some of surveys, other times it's post-conviction. It's <laughs> once again, um, I've done federal cases, state cases, multiple states, including Idaho, um, but the way I learned was from Dr. Ed Bronson, who was kind of a pioneer in the field. Um, he worked on cases like the Oklahoma City bombing case and a host of other private ones, the Boston Marathon, a bunch of them. Um, so he was kind of my mentor in this area. And there's a three-stage process. So the first phase is collecting the media coverage. Because really the question is, initially, is there extensive coverage and is there prejudicial coverage? So I collect the coverage and assess the nature of that coverage. Does it include... Um, inflammatory language. Does it include inadmissible or misinformation? Now, just because it's not true does not mean people don't see it, and it does not mean that they don't develop opinions based on that information. So it's very important. In fact, some of that stuff is the most prejudicial stuff that there can possibly be. For example, if there is a prior conviction and then the conviction is thrown out, well, that's pretty prejudicial for the new trial. Not admissible, but very prejudicial. So I'm looking for information like that. I'm looking for um, references to prior records, uh, maybe their uh, victim impact statements, where people, the victim's families may be suggesting what the outcome should be. That could be prejudicial. Um, how did the community respond? Are there candlelight vigils? Are there, um, you know, GoFundMe efforts going on? The status of the victims are focusing on that. So there's a gambit of things that we look at. Um, sometimes there's political elements that are important in high-profile cases because they might be that a politician's involved. So it just depends on the case. So the first thing is assessing the nature of the publicity. Now, if there's not a lot of extensive pretrial publicity and it's not prejudicial, it stops there. And that's happened where there's coverage, but it's very superficial. It's very neutral. There's not a lot of detail. There's nothing particularly um, impactful. Maybe it's focused primarily on just the, the victim or something like that. Um, however, there are other cases where there is extensive pretrial publicity. And then I would recommend phase two, which is a community attitude survey. Because just because there's prejudicial coverage does not mean it had an impact on the jury. And that is the question that matters most. What impact has the prejudicial media coverage had on the jury? Pool? I don't really care if it's correct information. It came from social media. It came from the news. It had an impact on the jury. pool. That's what matters because they develop opinions and attitudes. And it doesn't make a difference if that 
facts, true or false, they still develop an opinion and an attitude about the defendant, about the evidence and perceptions of guilt. All of that is what I'm looking at. So I want to see if the media coverage has had an impact. And that's how, why we do a community attitude survey. Um, and then depending on the results of the survey, we either, there's not enough evidence there to suggest that anything is required. It could be remedial measures such as individual sequestered blood deer. Maybe that's appropriate in some cases, all the way to the extreme case where it might be a change of it. I want to understand a little bit about the source of media you review. So just remember, this is a defense expert witness about surveying potential jurors. Imagine if they did something like this in Delphi. Oh my word, I think it would be important. But you'd be surprised though, you know, that people might not actually have heard of the case. I mean, how would they not? I don't know. But I think we all of us that follow true crime cases are like, how do you not know about that? <laughs> you know, if you see people, I don't know, in a grocery store, ask them if they know. Ask them if they know. I know I live across you know, across the pond on the other side of the world. I live in Switzerland. So <laughs> for me, it's a little different. People don't hear about all these cases. I wonder if everyone in Idaho has heard about it. You'll be surprised that maybe people haven't, you know? You to do your work. Can you tell me what you take a look at? And of course, they're looking at this one county because they, they ultimately would like a change of venue so that Brian Koberger can have a fair trial. I always look, I always take a conservative. Your Honor, I'm sorry, I need to object. I this PowerPoint is being prayed, played for everybody with no foundation. It's not an exhibit. Uh, I think that's improper. I mean, I, I'm trying to listen to, to Dr. Edelman's testimony, and I keep seeing slides changing in front of me over here, and I, I don't think that's appropriate. Well, you've, you've seen the slides. I have. The sound is good, right? I was just thinking the sound is good. And Matt was telling me that, yeah, sometimes with these Zoom meetings, you know, the MB Inc., by the way, if you don't know who I'm talking about, his channel's linked in the description box. Uh, he's, it's his stream that he recorded of this because, of course, the judge, he he streams it to his channel, but then it just vanishes afterwards. Just poof, gone. <laughs> so if you don't capture it, you don't have it. So thank you, MB Inc. And he said he boosted the sound as well to about like 400% so that we can hear nicely. So thank you so much. Okay, so... Let's uh, keep listening. It, get, it gets interesting, in my opinion. If you don't find it interesting, that's okay. I think this is very important and interesting. And I do wonder, will he get a change of venue? I think that Ann Taylor, sometimes I change my mind about her. But I think she's a very, very good defense attorney, you know. And she's really fighting for her client. And in this case, I, I would, I'd be surprised if they don't have a change of venue, right? You look good. Everybody else here has not What I'm seeing here, though, is just an explanation of how he goes about in surveys. Understand that. That's what his testimony is. But we're getting this visual aid that there's no foundation for, Judge. Well, I, it just seems, I, 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 I view, well, hold on. I, I, I'm viewing him as an expert. Okay? Yes, sir. And he's explaining what he does. So I'm going to. No problem with that. The PowerPoint's a problem. I don't have any problem with this testimony. All right. I'm sorry. I, uh, I, I yeah. frankly, I've never seen no, something like that. <laughs> I'm putting Bill Thompson a picture of him so you can visualize who we're hearing from now. You know, he's like, no, no, no. I don't. I don't like this PowerPoint. Like, what is what he can testify? What's up with the PowerPoint? What is this? <laughs> that objection. I mean, it is. This is not necessarily factual it's just an example of how he got to where, where he got that's his testimony but the powerpoint is different judge that's i don't know why we're seeing the powerpoint when we have his testimony you want to uh, respond to that i do okay. judge this is a courtroom demonstrative aid that helps to track the testimony of dr edelman i can hand in my computer and let him advance the screens if that makes a big difference in it I but it, this just helps explain his testimony. Judge, we don't have a jury here. Let's just proceed. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Go ahead. Dr. Edelman, we were talking about where you get your information. We were talking about the what? Where you get your information. What media do you look at? I think that's where it works. Yes. So I take a conservative approach to how I do it. Um, I look at newspapers in the lo local coverage right now. So I'm interested in papers that have primary circulation in the venue. Um, case like this has been reported 
in many other newspapers, but I wouldn't, for example, look at a newspaper published in Dallas because I don't know if somebody in Lake County would be looking at a paper in Dallas. So I look at the local coverage. I try to look at like local television coverage um, to see what the, the community is likely exposed to. While we're here, I want to ask you some questions about the non-dissemination theater. Okay. That's been a hot topic, and you've heard some of it again today. Are you aware that there's a non-dissemination order in this case? Yes. How did you become aware of it? Well, the first time I became aware of it was when I was reading the newspaper coverage, because that was one of the topics of media coverage, was discussing the non-dissemination order and media's efforts to have it changed. So I was able to read it and follow it in that media coverage. So that's the first time I saw it. And in January, did you receive an email from my office with the non-dissemination order? I believe I did. And you looked at a hard copy again recently? Yes. All right. Does that non-dissemination order change how you did your work? I'm sorry, can you? Does the existence of the non-dissemination order change how you did your work? No, it did not. Have you worked in cases where there's a non-dissemination order at other times? Many times. Was the sole source of the information that you used contained in the media? Was it contained in the media? Sorry. Yes. Everything I used was widely disseminated through the media. Widely disseminated. Did you find out where the media got the information? Yes. This is actually quite hectic when they pulled up this clip of Bill Thompson saying, okay, because like, did you find out where the media got the information? No, they're going to show Bill Thompson saying, well, we'll give you the media a copy, you know, of the public cause affidavit and all of that. So, <laughs> and then they're saying, you know, the media ran with it and had, you know, commentary on it and everything. I mean, that obviously includes uh, me and us right over here. <laughs> obviously, we always talk about probable cause affidavits and everything. And that one was pretty lengthy. Remember that we went over everything. If you've never seen it before, it is on the playlist. Hello to wait. Now I'm missing it. Where did the comment go? Papa Bear, I want to say hello to you. And I wanted to pull your uh, comment up. There we go. Those of us in the Moscow area want the trial here as a new venue will likely mean more travel or hardship for victims' families. But wherever it is, we want it to be a fair trial with true justice. Yes, that makes sense. Okay, true, true. Do you think they'll get a venue change or not? Do you think it'll be this year or not? <laughs> so far, the trial is set for... It's not There's not actually a date. They, they're aiming at the summer of 2025? My goodness. I don't even know if that'll happen. As Ann Taylor said, judge at this rate... We won't ever get to a trial like, oh, man. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Bill Thompson. I'm the Lake County Prosecutor. And it's sad to be here, but happy to be here at the same time. You turn it up. I can't hear. Well, I'm going to do my best. You know, I always wondered where people, when, at what point did people start saying Cole Burger? Because it's Co-Burger. There's no L. Co-Burger. But the prosecutor himself said Cole Burger over there. <laughs> Co burger, okay. <laughs> Tiny pet peeve. Let's turn this up. Yeah, you can't see. If I put the microphone up, is that better? I yeah. So you'll find. Yeah. But you don't have to type out things that are recorded here. Let me preface. There is a pending case now in court, and I in my office and the investigators have to live with the restrictions that our Supreme Court places on pretrial publicity. That said, I promise you we will share with you, through the court process or otherwise, whatever we are allowed to. I just appreciate your patience on that. The uh, factual basis for the charges are summarized in what's called a probable cause affidavit that is on file with the court. According to the rules of the Idaho Supreme Court, that is sealed until Mr. Kohlberger is physically back in Latah County and has been served with the Idaho arrest warrant. At that time, we expect that that affidavit will be available to you so you can share the true facts with all of your readers and your watchers and your listeners uh, and all the people who are interested and really need to know what's going on. So please have patience with us on that. Uh, we hope to get that to you as soon as we can. 
Okay, so D's, God, and Adventure says, if you watch this entire hearing, you'll find out he did not stalk the victims. But to clarify, they mean on social media, as, been, as has been reported widely, you know, worldwide in the media, that he stalked some of the victims, one or more, on Instagram or, you know, on social media. So not on social media. We don't have conclusive proof that he stalked them at the house either. That's speculative. But him being around the house, I know we're going to get into big debates now, but, you know, his phone pinging around the house, however wide that radius may be, that could be that voyeurism or stalking, but that's just speculation. There's no proof that we as the public have at all yet that he stalked anyone and definitely not on social media, which has been reported a lot. In that clip, you heard reference to the probable cause affidavit. Yes. And did you hear reference to sharing it with all your readers and watchers? Readers, watchers, and listeners, and anyone else who's interested. Did your research tell you that the media took Mr. Thompson up on that offer to share this far and wide? Yes. Good afternoon, folks. What did you say? Basically, the media took that document and then published the highlights and key findings in that document and added editorial commentary to that information. So let's be clear, they didn't just read the half David, there's editorial, there's debate, there's discussion, there's spin, all of it in news stories. And these stories, for example, this one has over 200, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see it. Do you have a copy of the... Uh -uh. I do. Um, Your Honor, I have a printed copy of his PowerPoint, if it would help him refresh his memory. I just can't see it. Sure. Just go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, example, this one is on a local television station. On YouTube alone, 130,000 views and 224 comments, so people discuss it. That's just one example of how this document was disseminated through the media in this county, just as Mr. Thompson suggested during his press conference. And did you check another media source and see that it continued to be shared? Yes, this is a second example. Um, and you can see just from the heading, it says court records unsealed. And then they go through a timeline, including information from that affidavit, um, highlighting all the key findings about the car and other things that are widely reported and disseminated from that document to late to count, saturating the community with prejudicial details from that document, which was reported in the press conference to be truthful as well. Um, 54,000 views, 176 comments on just one other video of, of a news clip on YouTube. And based on your research, did the story or stories continue to be shared far and wide? Yes. If Janelle Finch is joining Cases received massive media coverage, saturating this county with prejudicial pretrial rules. How about the social media? It was also spread through social media, and people have talked about it on social media. And do you know if misinformation and rumors ended up uh, as a result of this information shared right from the start? Yes, and the reason I looked at this and knew it was because in the media covers, they discuss the spreading of rumors on social media. For example, a professor who was accused by a psychic of being responsible for this. Um, other references to questioning the implication of people knew about the, um, the crime before it was reported to the police and so on. So there's been quite a bit of discussion, spread of rumors, misinformation, factual information all over social media, which you'd expect in a small community such as this. Did your review of all of this information tell you as a professional, as an expert in your field, that a survey was necessary in Brian Koberger's case? Yes, based off of the uh, media coverage that I reviewed, which was over 200 plus articles and the television coverage, I thought it was appropriate to move forward to see what impact, if any, this coverage has had on the community. What kind of survey did you think would be appropriate? Um, we always use random digit dial telephone surveys um, in, in these cases. Before you tell me a little bit more about that, I want to understand the history of this kind of survey. This Is this something that you just made up all on your own? No. 
Where does this come from? So these surveys have been done. Pause. Uh, Janet says, birthing hips just comes to mind. I mean, they didn't even include that in their questions. Is there room for question number 10? Did you hear that Coburger said, hey, you have nice birthing hips on a date with someone? Did you ever hear that? And then they will know if they follow the case or not, right? Um, for decades. Um, the first one I recall that followed a similar design focus on case-specific items was done in 1979 um, Constantini and King in three cases in Yolo County, California. Um, this approach was done, you know, Dr. Ed Bronson, who I mentioned, my mentor, had been using it for decades, 40 years or more. Um, other experts in the field do it. John Walker, when from the American Taliban case, they used a similar approach that was published as well. Um, used in skilling, Boston Marathon. Um, I've used it in countless cases, so hundreds of times, I would say. Is there research that supports this process? There is. Um, one of the things we're looking at, so when you think about the survey, is the structure and, and how we test validity. So there's 40 plus years of social science literature on the impact of media coverage on jury, jury decision making. And one of the things it tells us, for example, is knowledge. Well, or let's take a step back. People who regularly watch and listen to the news are more likely to know about the case. When they say know about the case, are more likely to have case specific information from the media. So they test similar things like we did. Have you read, seen, or heard if dot, dot, dot. And they assess how much knowledge does this person have? And then they correlate it with media consumption habits. And what you find is people that read the news regularly know more of these details than people who do not. And they find that the more information you have, the more likely you are to hold an opinion regarding the defendant's guilt or innocence. So those are some of the findings. And we craft the survey similar to the others because we want to test the validity of the survey so if we know we should see these relationships we should expect to see them in our survey so we ask the same similar types of questions and we look at those relationships to see if we see the same thing that's one of the ways we test the validity of the would this be considered a methodology in your field to do surveys in a certain format yes it's standard practice we look at um, APOR, which is called the american association of public opinion research American Society of Trial Consultants, they have professional code on how to conduct surveys, venue surveys. Um, those are the primary ones I look at. Uh, and again, there's I've taken course training during my program on how to craft surveys, how to write questions, all of that type of thing. I've done it hundreds of times, um, testified about it. Um, so that's kind of the basis of how I craft this. And I heard you mention standards and validity. Mm -hmm. um, why why are there standards why does that matter i'm sorry why are there standards yes well one is you want to make sure i mean there, as we learn more about research and, and human behavior we learn more about what you should and shouldn't do so for example um there's something called social desirability um people want to create a positive impression of themselves so when you ask questions for example can you be a fair juror well, we all want to be fair people, so you're more likely to get a socially desirable response. The initial step on that was all the way back into voting. Um, in California, there is a... a We're going to be here for a while, though, okay? Because this is two hours and 15 minutes of, a hearing, of hearing footage, and I deflect the first 20 minutes, which was also quite snarky. If you do ever want to see it, it's on MB Inc.'s channel, which I've linked in the description box. So uh, Heather said the survey isn't the issue. They want to move the trial location. So yeah, it's kind of like a means to an end. The goal of the defense would be to get a new venue for the trial. And this is the way that they're doing it, right? The uh, election for governor, I think it's Davis or something like that. Uh, and all of the polling suggested he was going to win. He was African-American and um, he lost. And that was when they started looking at that. And they saw all these different impacts in terms of like race of the interviewer, all these things affect how people respond. People overestimate that they vote because you can look at voting records and it's inflated. People overestimate they have a library card and a million other things. So those are things like we look at when we craft the survey. We don't want to have social questions that lead to social desirable responses, order effects, and a host of objects. In your survey, it looks like you have sections designed in your survey. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you? Can you hear me? Okay. Better with the microphone. Okay. I'll try to stand closer over here. I want to I want to understand this section, the, these sections. Okay. Why do you have sections in this survey? Sections? Yes. Well, one is you don't want things to be jumping back and forth all over the place because um, it's harder to take a survey like that. You'll have more people drop off. 
confusion, potential order effects. So we try to organize the survey into sections. So all the key questions on one topic are together, and then the next section changes topics, so it's easy to follow. What is the purpose of Section 3, Case Awareness and Prejudgment? Why is that in there? So that's the meat of the survey. That's the most important section. Um, so case awareness measures initially case recognition. We craft a recognition question based off of the media coverage. What are the things widely reported that are not overly prejudicial because you don't want to create an order that would stimulate a memory of, yes, I remember that case. So if widely reported A, B, and C facts that every you, know, you read the coverage and you see this was mentioned 100 times, that's a widely reported fact. So we create case recognition question. Now, if somebody says, yes, I remember that case, I have read, seen, or heard about it, they are asked a prejudgment question next, guilt or innocence question. Um, then they're asked open-ended questions and then those case-specific items. Now, let's say someone does not remember the, the case based on the back, the case recognition question. We give them one more fact to see if it'll stimulate a memory. Something neutral that might stimulate a memory. You usually get 1% to 2% more that we call the case for that. If that person recognizes the case from there, they are also asked that prejudgment question to be continued. If they do not recognize the case, they skip the rest of the survey and they're asked demographic questions about media consumption habits and demographics. Um, the next step of the survey after the prejudgment question is uh, an open-ended question. What have you read, seen, or heard about the case? There might be a few others we add based off of these things we might find in the media coverage. And then they continue on to those case-specific items that we've been talking about. Have you read, seen, or heard if so and so? I want to make sure I understand this and that this is clear for everybody. Those nine questions that have been the problem last week and this week, if you have somebody who says, no, I don't know that case, do you ask them those nine questions? No, they skip to the demographic questions. What? Tell me, what are the demographic questions, just to be sure? If somebody doesn't recognize the case, they immediately go to questions, for example, how often do you read the newspaper? Every day, several times a week, uh, rarely, never, something like that. Then they're asked how often they follow the local news, and then they'll ask a few demographic questions like age, gender, race, ethnicity. So if somebody doesn't remember the case, you don't infuse information or do any of the things that were brought out last week? No. I have on the screen in front of me some of the read, seen, or heard questions. Yes. What are these? You don't have to read them all. Just tell me what they are. These are nine items, which we always use. Have you read, seen, or heard if? And these are items taken from the media coverage that were widely reported. And let me be clear, widely reported hundreds and thousands of times. Um, and Were they as widely reported as the birthing hips that Brian Koberger likes? <laughs> Someone said there in chat, Angel Fire. You said, imagine if it was Koberger's idea to come up with a survey. He was a criminal justice student, right? Getting his PhD. Oh, my goodness. And he did like surveys. Remember that. Oh, my word. When I saw that, I'm like, what? He does do surveys. Anyway, so, yeah, these questions, they're not exactly vague. Huh? These questions are pretty specific. I'm loving all your comments. Thank you so much for, you know, telling me what you think as we listen to this hearing. Potentially prejudicial items because neutral run-of-the-mill media coverage is often not grounds for a change of that. So if somebody knew there were four victims, that's not particularly prejudicial, is it? That's a pretty benign fact. But if somebody knows, for example, um, about a prior conviction that's not admissible, that's very prejudicial. And it might be correlated with prejudgment. And I would like to know that because if it's widely prejudicial and everybody knows about it and it's correlated pre with prejudgment, that may that would likely have an impact on my recommendations because that's the type of pre-child publicity that has been recognized by the Supreme Court. I'm sure the state court here that is most concerning. So these kinds of questions, these case specific questions, you do this in all the surveys that you do. Yes. And um, in this case, these nine questions came straight out of the media. Absolutely. And again, widely reported throughout the media, thousands of times. Now, just to be clear, you gave an example of um, information that might be widely reported that's highly prejudicial that you would use in a survey. Um, you haven't talked about Brian Koberger's survey yet, have you? Um, what you you haven't told us the nine questions. I have not. Okay. And um, we'll get there, but I want to talk about a little bit more about the history of this survey. You told us it had been used for decades, 
And I think you told us a little bit about some of the other really high profile cases where this survey format, the survey, survey method that's been widely accepted was used. I, are some of these cases your cases that you've done these surveys in on this list? Yes, uh, I used these types of questions in the George Floyd case for Alexander King, who was one of the defendants. There was also a gag order or non-dissemination order in that case. The Parkland shooting case in Florida, there was a non-dissemination order in that case. Used there as well. Used it in the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting case in Pittsburgh. Um, State of Idaho v. Jonathan Renfro, which was here. State of Idaho v. Gilberto Rodriguez also used it there. And many others. I've used it 100 times. Dr. Bronson used it more than me because he was doing it even longer than I have. Um, other experts in the field do it. This is the standard practice. Standard in your field. Yes. And are these surveys, doing a survey like this, is this just criminal defendants that ask you to do these surveys or that have any interest in doing these surveys, or is it other people too? Um, other people use the same process as well, including the prosecution and the government. I think you provided an example in your PowerPoint of the government using this survey process in yes. a case that you worked on. Yes, this was the Jason Van Dyke case in Chicago. He had, uh, had been charged with shooting and killing Laquan McDonald. Um, it was like 17 shots was like the famous thing. Uh, it was a very significant case, interracial crime, widely reported on. Um, and the government also did their own survey to see if there was any potential bias and follow the same exact process and use case-specific media items. And once again, there was a non-dissemination order in that case. Earlier, you talked a little bit about validity being one of the standards. Yes. Tell me, tell me how you measure validity in one of these surveys. Sure. So this is from the professional code from the American Society of Trial Consultants. Um, as I mentioned, we want to look at things like consistency. So we want to, for example, the research tells us the more case or media items you know, you develop knowledge. And the more you know, the more likely you are to exhibit bias. So I want to test that in the survey. That's one of the reasons why I include those case-specific items. Um, I also want to compare what people, uh, or that item, to prejudgment. So the more people know, are they more likely to prejudge? How about case-specific media items? Is there specific prejudicial items in the media that are particularly concerning? Maybe if I'm going to go back to my prior conviction example. If there, if there was a conviction, because I've had this happen in the case, and then years later, that conviction was thrown out and there's a new trial. Well, that's extremely prejudicial if people know about the prior jury verdict. So I want to know, do people, what percentage of people know that detail? And is that related to prejudgment? And most importantly, when you ask the question, have you read, seen, or heard about the case? The open-ended question, do people report it? Because if they don't and they do know it, well, that's very concerning. And that's the type of problem we run into in voir dire. Sounds like that's one of the reasons you have case-specific questions in there. Quick pause. Lola Hearts is probably not popular opinion, but Ann Taylor AT seems shrewd. This is pretty smart on her part. I think she does a good job of being a defense attorney, right? Also, we are going to see this uh, expert visually when there's the cross-examination from the prosecutor. They just, I think, we're just seeing the presentation now. So we can't see both things at once. <laughs> I don't know why. I wish we could. But they're showing the presentation now. And later we'll see more from the courtroom, okay? That's one of the reasons, absolutely. You heard talk last week and then you've heard it again today about can't you just change this survey and take those case-specific questions out and then do the survey? Can you do that? I would not do that, no. Can you explain why not? Because this is based off of 15 years of doing this. I know for certain, and there's research on it as well, that when you ask people an open-ended question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? They have a difficult time recalling everything from memory. That's a recall question. The cognitive effort required to recall everything from memory that you know is very challenging versus recognition, which is a much lower cognitive look. Have you read, seen, or heard if? Oh, now I can search my memory. Yes, I know that fact. If I asked you, tell me everything you know about the movie Star Wars, you would tell me a whole bunch of interesting things about Chewbacca and Ewoks and maybe a bunch of other stuff. But I am very confident that you would miss things. You would not tell me every single detail from memory you know about that movie. And then I would ask you something like, did you know that Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father? And you'd probably say, yeah, of course, I knew that. But you didn't mention it in the recall question. Um, there's a mountain of research on this. Usually what they do is they have people read 
um, like a paragraph or a story, and they have them write down everything you recall from what you just read. And then they do a different type of quiz. Did you read that the truck was red? Did you read that there was an ambulance? Oh, yeah, of course. And they check that too. And what it shows is recognition rates, the ability to recall information when asked a closed ended question, is much higher than when you ask an open ended question. So, getting back to your comment or question, if I only ask, what do you read, know about this case? I know for a fact you'll get things like, well, I remember when it happened. There were four victims. There was a knife. Um, I remember there's a delay. Um, I just saw it in the media. Those are the things that people said. They've said it in this survey. They've said it in a hundred surveys I've done prior. They've said it in Vladir when I look at transcripts. That's what you see. But when you ask those closed-ended questions, you discover that they know quite a bit more. And that's what I'm trying to look at. I need to. He, ma he makes a good point, though, right? Sorry for interrupting right there. He makes a good point. Checking for uh, confirmation bias. You know, those types of questions you'll really know if they know. You know, what do people actually know? And is there information, prejudicial details that they don't mention that they do know when you ask the open to the question. And those, those details, the closed questions, the have you read, seen, or heard questions, are they important to determine if there's bias, that media coverage has created a prejudicial effect and others bias? Absolutely. If 80% of people are able to recognize a prejudicial detail, um, and I keep making up because I don't want to upset anyone here, like a prior conviction, if 80% know that detail, but only 3% mention it in the question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case, that's a major problem. I need to know that because it's an extremely prejudicial fact. Things spread on social media, whether they're true or not, they still impact the jury. Very prejudicial. I need to know if they know that. And I know for a fact in this case that, for example, I'm not going to mention the detail, but for one of them, only 3%, 3% of people in the survey mentioned the detail when asked, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? It was something spread on social media. But when you asked, have you read, seen, or heard of X, Y, and Z, 45% knew that fact. And that fact happened to be significantly related to prejudgment. People who knew it, over 80% of them think the defendant is guilty compared to 57% who don't know the detail. So those are important findings. If I don't include those questions, I can't do any of those analyses. It makes it look like there's not that much of a problem here. People don't seem to know anything. They just say they remember reading it in the paper. I guess we don't have to move the case because they don't seem to know much. And that is misleading, um, inaccurate. And I would not do that. Have you had um, a unique opportunity to kind of actually watch this in real time to see how it works? I have. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. How did you get this unique opportunity yeah. first? So th th I worked on a case that was called John Fight. Um, this was a Catholic priest in Hidalgo County in Texas who had been charged with murdering a beauty queen. Now, the crime had happened in like the 1950s, and the trial happened in like 2018 or something like that. So every, the, every, all the witnesses were gone, and the defendant was obviously much older. But it was a case that was just weaved in the fabric of the community because it was so shocking. And during the hearing, after doing the survey, one of the things we did is we brought in community residents and did like a mock voir dire to prove this point, to demonstrate. And there was a bunch of things in that case that were particularly prejudicial. So we asked people, tell us what you've read, seen, or heard about the case. And they would tell us, oh, in college, I learned about this case. So I know A, B, and C. And we say, is that everything you remember? And they said, for example, here, I believe so. That's what this person said. Search their memory. Let's see. I believe so. That's it. And then we asked those case specific questions that you clearly could never ask in one year because you'd be poisoning a well. And we asked, for example, did you know that John Fight gave a confession to a priest, confessed to the crime? Oh, yeah, I knew that. And once she said that, it stimulated her memory. Actually, he confessed twice. So now she knows that. The fact that she did not mention in the open-ended question, extremely prejudicial. The Supreme Court has recognized confessions to be very prejudicial for Doe v. Louisiana, a bunch of others. And she knows that. And then we asked, kind of again, is that everything you know? And she says yes. And then we give her another one. Did you know that he was involved in another case? He had actually been involved, charged with attacking a woman at a different church. Oh, yeah. Yes, I do remember that. Once again, she knows a detail that she didn't mention. And we're saying, okay, and you didn't say that a few minutes ago. Why did you? No. That's the second one. Um, and then we asked, have you refreshed your memory? Are there any other facts that you have read, seen, or heard that you haven't told the court? She's, I don't believe so. so. It seems like that's all she knows. Then we try it again, and we mentioned that he... Um, had been transferred to another monastery. The Catholic Church was moving him around. And she knows that. Said, oh, yeah, I did do that. Um, and we tried again. Did you know that local law enforcement um, were participating in a, in a cover-up? That was part of the story. Yeah, she knows that. Too. So this was an example 
of the difference between asking the open-ended question that you can ask in voir dire, what do you know about this case? What have you seen or heard about this case? And you get an answer. Sometimes people say, I just recall when it happened. Sometimes you get more detail. But when you start asking those closed-ended questions, you uncover that actually they know quite a bit more. Uh, and that is the key point in a high-profile case. In the general case, it doesn't matter because there's no case-specific information. What we know is that specific attitudes predict behavior much more than general attitudes. So in a community like this, has been saturated with media coverage that's prejudicial, we want to know what case-specific details they know, because that goes to bias, and are we able to ferret out that bias in jury selection? And that's why we include those questions in our survey. I want to talk about Brian Koberger's case for just a minute. Your Honor, again, I'm going to register the objection. This is, dealing, this is going to deal with the actual issue of change of venue. It's premature. The state has not been afforded the opportunity to analyze much less, much, yet much less respond to it. Um, so to the extent that the court wishes to allow this to continue, I just simply ask you to give it that reduced amount of weight because the state is not in a position to respond to any of this. Okay, what's thank you. But you, you'll have an opportunity to respond to any of this where I make a decision. Um, not today, Judge. This, I'm this goes, this, this, this not, goes, I'm sorry. Hold on. Yes, I'm sir. not going to make a decision today. Yes, sir. I'm getting information. Yes, sir. And uh, then I'm going to consider what you're going to uh, provide, and then I'm going to make a decision. My point again, Your Honor, is this goes to the issue of a change of venue, not whether or not the non-disclosure order was violated and what we should do about that. Two separate issues. The state is not prepared and will not be prepared to address a change of venue issue until an appropriate motion with supporting um, documentation and evidence provided. And we have a chance to respond to that, which I understand we'll be doing between now and sometime next month. Exactly. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Dr. Edelman, go ahead. You're, you haven't finished analyzing the data in Mr. Koberger's case, have you? No, the only thing I looked at was supposed to be on the question at the end, which is about these case-specific items, why they're in the survey, whether, and which goes to whether we can continue the survey without them. That's the only thing I looked at was addressing that specific question. I'm not going to ask you what your opinion on change of venue is today. I don't have one. Well, I do, but I'm not done analyzing the data. Senate, I want you to be informed before we get there. So I do want to talk, though, about Brian Koberger's case and if you've been able to determine if the survey was valid. Yes, absolutely. And how did you determine that the survey is valid? Well, one of the things, as, as I mentioned, is looking at the social science research and do we find similar findings? And we did. So we also look, for example, do we have like acquiescence bias? What that means is people are just saying yes to everything. So on those key specific media items, one of the things you do is you include items that were didn't receive as much media attention. That way, you want to make sure, and what you expect to see are items that get a lot of media attention, everybody knows about. So you can see really high recognition rates, 80%, 90%, 60%. And then the items that didn't get as much attention, they're lower, 40% or less. So we want to see if there's variance across the questions, and we see that as well. Does it help to do the recall questions and the recognition questions to understand whether you have a valid survey? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, well, as I meant, those are the case-specific questions. Yeah, those media items. So we, we test validity by, are those correlated with prejudgment? Um, are they correlated with media consumption? So people who read more of the media, do they know more of these details than people who don't? Um, are there, if you, the more details you know, are you more likely to be biased? All that stuff. But also, again, like I said, is you want to check to make sure there's variance across those media items because you want to make sure people aren't just saying yes to everything. You talked early on about how if somebody doesn't recognize the case, you stop and you don't ask these case-specific media-generated items. In your That's correct. And remember, these media items also come after the open-ended, what have you ever seen or heard about the case? Do you know how many people did not know about Brian Koberger's case in this survey, the percentage? I believe it was like 3 to 4%. And so that percentage of people didn't get the case specific questions. Is that fair? The people who did not know about the case, very few, did not get the case specific questions. Oh, I want to talk about the open ended questions and then the have you read, seen, or heard questions. So on the open ended questions, when you say, What do you know about this case? Tell me everything. Uh, do you know about how many things people remember? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things we do is we read everyone 
and we track how many details they mention, and then we compare them, what do they say, to how many case-specific items they later recognize. So for example, if somebody said, I know four people were killed and they found the guy, I would identify like they, you know, two facts, two details, for example. And then I would look at those case-specific items later and how many of those items did he mention in the open? And that scenario would be zero. But if he knew six of them, that would tell me that he knew six details that he failed to recognize um, versus somebody might have known all those details and mentioned all of them in their open. Then it would be zero. They reported everything they knew and they mentioned later on that they knew those items. So I look at that. You're checking what they say they know in the general open question and then see if they hit some of the specific questions right. and then measuring how many more they actually know when you get to the have you read seen right. other question. And then I compare. And that kind of goes to my John Fight story. I'm looking to see if that is a problem. What did you find in this case? I found that 96% of survey respondents knew at least one additional media item that they failed to mention in the open-ended question. Um, on average, people reported 1.6 details when asked the question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? However, on average, they later recognized six out of the nine media items, and I believe it's something like 72% knew, set, I want to say five or more. Now, in, in this situation, did you find out people had a lot of knowledge that wasn't the specific case-related question? They would rattle off, I know these things, several things. Yeah, so, so what I found was, on average, people knew at 4.9 additional items that they failed to mention in the open. So what does that mean? That means they knew approximately five of the media items that I tested later that they did not mention in the open-ended. Five. On average, out of nine, they knew, although they didn't mention it. And these are examples. So somebody wrote just what has been on the TV and the papers. That's the common thing you get when you only ask the open-ended question. But that person knew all nine of the media items we tested. Someone else mentioned the detail. The kids were murdered, and they tracked them down. Well, you actually know six out of the nine media items that we tested. Nothing lately knows seven out of the nine media items tested. And it goes on and on. That is a very common finding. I find it in almost every survey I do, between 92 and 96% is the norm. What I see in terms of knowing more detail than they report. And usually, interestingly, the average is usually around three extra media items that they failed to mention. In this case, it was 4.9, so it was higher. Do you have a way within the survey to correlate prejudicial coverage or bias for guilt with the amount of specific details recognized? Yes, because I asked those case specific questions. If I didn't, I would not be able to, because as you saw, people say things like, haven't seen anything lately. Well, that doesn't really do much for me. I can't analyze that. I can't do anything for that. I don't ask those case specific items. I can't test the validity of the survey. I can't test to see how case specific knowledge impacts prejudgment. I can't test to see if there's one particular item that's highly prejudicial that we should be worried about, that should, you know, that's inadmissible. What percentage knows that detail? Um, all of those things are required to do is correct. And how do you know that there's prejudgment in a case? How, what questions do you ask, and when do you ask them to know that there's prejudgment or bias in a uh, case? Well, after the case recognition question, they're asked, based off of what you've read, seen, or heard about this case, do you believe the defendant's guilty of whatever the crime is, and it's on scale, of like definitely guilty to definitely not guilty. Um, so that's a prejudgment question. I have a second follow-up question, which was actually developed from a judge that I thought was really effective. And the question was, um, would the defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? So it was a presumption of guilt as opposed to a presumption of innocence. This was in Tennessee. It was a high-profile case. And similarly, people would report a lot of detail, and then they'd say, I think he's guilty. And then they'd ask, well, can you be fair and impartial? And go, yeah, I think I could be fair. I can try. I think I could do it. And then the court would ask, well, would the defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? And they'd say, oh, yeah, definitely. He could be hard to change my mind. So I use that question because I thought it was really effective. And it happens to correlate much better than a set-aside question with prejudgment um, and a host of other things. Did you ask those questions before you say, have you read, seen, or heard these particular Absolutely. If you quick, quick pause there. Uh, welcome. If you're only joining the stream now, I see there's a few more people that just joined. So we are listening to this 
hearing from yesterday about this um, the Idaho 4 case, of course. And it's Brian Koberger's defense attorney, Ann Taylor, that you can hear asking questions to an expert that the defense has hired to conduct a survey where they surveyed 400 people. 400 people were asked about the evidence in the case and the defense had planned to ask several hundred more. So let me just quickly read this little article to you just to refresh our recollection of what we're all doing here. I've also got clues on the screen up there what the hearing when it was and all of that, if you missed it. So prosecutors in the Brian Koberger murder case. Of course, he's the defendant on trial. I always hate it when they call it the, the defendant's case, but it is his case now. He's going to trial, right? And it's a death penalty case as well. They have objected, prosecutors have objected to half-baked results of a phone poll being released. And then Bill Thompson says, I just did not want this to come willy-nilly into the public record in a half-baked fashion. Okay, quite a, quite a sentence there. Bill Thompson said at a hearing in Idaho on Wednesday, the controversial poll of potential jurors was commissioned by Coburg's defense team to assess the attitudes of potential jurors in Latar County, where four students were stabbed to death. 400 people were asked about the evidence in the case, and the defense had planned to ask several hundred more. Thompson said the poll of potential jurors has not been completed, and he did not want partial results being entered into the public record. He said he wanted the wording of the survey to be changed before it's allowed to continue. However, he said that the defense told him by emails two days previously that it could not be changed. I would have been happy to discuss some middle ground, but the line has been drawn in black and white, he said. He added that presenting the partial results in court would be premature. Now, as a recap quickly, Koberger, 29, has been charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony burglary in connection with the fatal stabbings of Kaylee Consolves, who was only 21 years old, Madison Mogan, 21, Zana Kunodal, 20, and Ethan Chapin, 20. The bodies of the four University of Idaho students were found in an off-campus residence on November 13th of 2022. So we've been following this case uh, closely. There's lots of coverage that I have on the playlist for you. If you do want to catch up, if you've never heard of it or you don't know too much about it, you can check it out there. Of course, many of you, you know, you're not, uh, I'm saying it, like, it's weird to say that now while we're listening to this. But if you're local, okay, don't, don't be on the jury. Tell them you know all about the case, of course. But uh, if you want to catch up and know all the details that we know so far, including a detailed read-through of, the, of that probable cause affidavit that they're addressing here as well, it's all on the playlist for you. Thank you again to MB Inc. for capturing this for us because, of course, it's a Zoom hearing that Judge John Judge, <laughs> Triple J, <laughs> he has um, he allows on his channel, but then it disappears from his channel. So if you don't capture it, you kind of miss it. Of course, mainstream media also has it. But I'm very grateful that we can watch this together. So we still have... Quite a way to go. We're, less, we're 51 minutes in out of two hours and 15. Uh, the prosecution will also ask this uh, expert witness questions. And yeah, he gets, uh, the prosecutor gets quite, you know, frustrated with all of it. If you didn't, you'd be creating order. So you have to do that. Will you say that again? You'd be creating what? Order effects. Uh, if, I, if I put in, a, in like a recognition question, some detail that's extraordinarily prejudicial. I'll go back to my prior conviction thing for the same crime. And then you say, oh, do you think he's guilty? Well, you just told me he had jury convicted. Of course I think he's guilty. So you, 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 if you included all those nine items and then you ask somebody, do you think he's guilty? You just gave them all this information that's prejudicial. So yes, that would be an order. Of, so you would never do that. So you ask them well ahead of case specific well, questions. They have to recognize the case. They have to agree, I know of this case. And then you ask if they already have an idea of what they think whether Mr. Coburger is guilty or not in our case. Correct. And then you have the case recognition and you can measure the bias or the prejudicial effect of the media like with poorly. the incidence of those questions. What right? I look at is the prejudgment question, right? That's on a scale, it's a Likert scale. Um, and then I can look at things like, is a relationship between the number of details somebody knows and the strength of opinion? Definitely guilty, for example, if you know a lot of detail. I can look at case-specific items, uh, media items. Um, if you knew about X, is that correlated with prejudgment or bias? Is there something that, you know, and so on and on. So that's how we look at the relationship between prejudgment um, and these different factors. Were you able to determine if case knowledge was impacting bias in Brian Coverter's case? Yes. So because we asked these questions, what we found is that um, 
one of my, like I said, very high recognition rate. So 79% of respondents knew at least five of these items. So the idea that we're sat, like, undermining his due process rights, everybody knows all this stuff. It's very high rates. Um, 82% of respondents who recognize seven of these items or more reported that he's guilty, compared to if they only knew two or fewer, only 29% thought he was guilty. And the average was 6.2. So the average number of these details people already know, 6.2. Given specific case-related bits of information, these nine have you read, seen, or heard questions, does recognizing one of those questions, if that's a, oh yeah, I know that one, yeah. does that change the incidence of bias, or does that relate to, I've already prejudged this case? It does. Um, and what's really interesting is kind of going back to the open-ended question. So the, um, again, I won't mention the detail, but there's one that was widely reported, it's in that affidavit, and 81% um, of survey respondents knew that specific detail. 81% when we asked, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? However, on the previous question, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case, the open-ended, only 8% reported it. 8% report it when you ask the open-ended question. 81% actually know the detail when you ask a recognition question. That's significant, and I can only do that analysis because we asked those questions. And 72% of people who knew that detail reported that he is guilty compared to just 47% who don't know the detail. So that's the kind of analysis we look at. What do these case-specific items look like? Um, if you know this media item, is it correlated with guilt? What percentage of people know that media item? How many people mention it in the open? Is it consistent where it's a perfect overlap or nobody says, talks about it, but they all know it? And another one, only three, I think it was 3%, 3% mentioned a specific detail that was on social media, widely reported in the news, not factually accurate, a, a misrepresentation of the truth. 45% knew it in the survey. Only 3% reported it in the open-ended comment. And it was extraordinarily prejudicial where if you did know it, 81% of survey respondents, if they knew that detail, indicated that the defendant was guilty. 81%, half the sample knew about it, but only 3% mentioned it when I asked the open-ended question. So again, if I didn't ask those questions, and the only thing I asked was the open-ended question, it would appear that people don't know a lot of prejudicial detail because they don't mention the detail when you ask that question. And that is, from my experience, doing post-conviction work, reading what year transcripts, coding transcripts, doing hundreds of jury selections, being involved in these cases, coding jury questionnaires. This is the phenomenon that we see all the time. It's nothing new. And the only way to look at it is by doing the survey this way. Before I ask the question about courts relying on surveys to make decisions, using these surveys to make decisions to change venue, when you talk about things that are in the media that aren't true or might not come in, we've heard a lot about that today. Do, are you telling me that that's still going to be in my courtroom? Things that aren't true that don't get brought out in trial, those are still going to be in the jurors' minds? Absolutely. And again, there's social science research on this, looking at the impact of inadmissible content, the effectiveness of judicial instructions, and how it impacts jury decision making. Just because you say it's not evidence doesn't mean it's not prejudicial. Just like if I know it, um, it impacts how I view the defendant. It serves as a filter through how I process information. I might expect to hear that information when I can assume that I will, so it has an impact. One interesting study looked at jurors' ability, or response, survey response, no, sorry, participants' ability to recall the source of information. And what they found is after a few days after a trial, people couldn't recall what information they had learned from the media and what information they recalled and learned from the trial. So they assumed stuff in the media came out in trial. So the idea that I can cognitively say, okay, I know this prejudicial detail, and I'm going to put it in a box in my mind and never think about it and process everything, um, and it's never going to affect me. It's just there's nothing to support that. It's kind of in our everyday lives. That's what our brains work. Like, think about what's going on today with Trump and Biden and all that. Everybody has strong opinions. The idea that, oh, yeah, well, it's not legitimate or that fact is wrong. It's misinformation, so it won't affect me. There's nothing to support that. There's even research that shows you, you have people, you, they read a passage, that they write something supporting a, a, a position that was in the passage, and then you tell them that information is not true. It's called belief perseverance or belief persistence. And what they find is even when you tell them that fact is not true, they still have a difficult time not believing it, and it still impacts their views. They still defend it, even then. 
So there's a host of research on this. The idea that we should only test things that are factually accurate and assume that the other stuff isn't prejudicial is just ridiculous. So a massive amount of prejudicial media coverage is a factor that has to be considered in a case with this kind of coverage. Is that right? Yes. I, I want to no, though, from your experience, have you done a survey like this that contained these nine case-specific questions where a judge decided to change venue? Yes. Will you tell us about that? Yes. So in, in Nichols, there was a case in Washington, and this is kind of what I was referring to. So it was a defendant who had been convicted in 2012 for murder in Grant County, Washington. Um, later, it was a high-profile case, and then later the conviction was thrown out. It had something to do with jury instructions or something like that, and there was going to be a new trial. And, you know, Quite a bit of time had gone by, like a decade. Um, so we did a survey because that fact, knowing that detail, would be highly prejudicial. So what we found was 42% of, of survey respondents had read, seen, or heard about the prior conviction when we asked that case-specific media item. However, when we asked the open-ended question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case, only 12% mentioned it. So 12% mentioned it. When you ask the open-ended question, you do some blood here, but over 42% knew about it. Now, you can never ask a juror, well, did you know a jury convicted him of murder if you didn't mention it because you're poisoning a well? Um, and the court agreed and was worried about the effectiveness of blood here as a remedy in that situation and granted a change of that. Have you had the opportunity uh, to pay attention to any prejudicial media coverage since the hearing last week? I have. What is that coverage? Well, it created a misrepresentation, false narrative that we, myself specifically, had done something to, wrong to poison the well, taint the jury pool, um, and using language like that. That became part of the narrative. Um, I saw it on Reddit, on social media, in the news, that once again, going into this idea of what the story was, that the defense had done something wrong, debate about whether it was part of their tactic to delay, um, get them off on technicality, and so on. And again, what I did, just want to be clear, is the standard practice in the industry done hundreds of times in high-profile cases throughout this country. There's nothing I did to contaminate the jury pool. Everything I included was widely disseminated by the media in this county hundreds of times, if not more. And they, most of it came directly from an affidavit that the government released in a press conference and encouraged everyone to report on. Okay, I like seeing all the different opinions here about this. Uh, the poll uh, asked to you, do you think the defense experts should be allowed to continue to survey potential jurors? 37% said yes, and 63% said no. Interesting. So the next hearing for this change of venue motion hearing will be June 27th. I think they said it'll be. So it's still quite a while away. Um, I find all this very interesting. Did I tell you what questions to ask? You did not. Would you take my advice if I told you what questions to ask? I would not. And I'll tell you why. Is, as I mentioned, my role is to be an objective expert to provide the court with information so the court can make a decision on if any remedial measures are necessary. I don't care what questions you want in the survey, and I don't care what questions the government wants in the survey. What I want to do is conduct a valid survey that's subjective, reliable, and provides meaningful information that can be used by the court. Do you believe comparative surveys in other counties would provide the court with more information about what to do when we get to change the venue hearing? I do. Why? Because this case has received a lot of media attention across the state. It's a national case. And depending on what the results are of the survey, I'm assuming if we find that there's grounds for a change of venue here, that's a recommendation, the responsible people, there's nowhere else to move it. Everybody's been cut saturated with free child publicity, so there's no need to change it. The point of the comparison survey is to address that question. Is there anywhere in the state where you could do that? Maybe there's not. I don't know. Um, but that's the only way to find out. And you have to conduct the survey in the same manner. I don't know. If I just ask people what they know about the case, and you get general, I just recall when it happened, but you have the same guilt rate. Do they know inadmissible details? Do they know about things from that affidavit? Do they have a lot of case-specific knowledge? Or is it just a general awareness of the case? Do they drive by the house where the crime occurred, all these things, all these things that make this county unique, 
that you want to test for in other communities. So it's not just a question of general awareness. I need to know what case-specific information they have, what misinformation they have, what media items they've been exposed to. Do they have as much uh, case detail and knowledge as they do here? All of those things. So that's why I would suggest it's important. Um, without that, the only thing I can do would be to collect the media coverage and assess, for example, like, are there fewer articles published in Bonneville County or Ada County compared to here? That's all we have. I wouldn't conduct a survey that I know is going to lead to misleading information. I'm not going to do that. To change the survey, would that go against the methodology that you use? Yes. If I, if I change the survey and I don't conclude those items, I can't test. Well, do people know a lot of case-specific information that was widely reported? Are those specific items related to bias? Um, which items do they know? Do they know the ones that were all over social media or not? Like, but that's the whole point of asking those questions. What you'll get is, well, I don't know much, but I saw it when it first happened. I remember reading about it a while ago, but haven't seen anything like it. I know the defendant was, uh, you know, arrested or whatever. Um, or things like, oh, I followed it close. Okay, great. I followed it closely. Does that mean they know a lot? I don't know. I can't assess just from someone said, I read the news or I followed it quite a bit. That doesn't tell you anything. That's not meaningful information. So, yes, we need to conduct it in some fashion. Last week, your professionalism, your work, your reputation was impugned. I believe it was, yes. If you're allowed, if the court says, okay, go ahead and finish these surveys, I want comparative county information, are you willing to still work with us? If we do it correctly, if the idea is we want you to conduct a leading bias survey to get results that we want, then no, I'm not going to do something that undermines my credibility, my objectivity, or do it in any way that's not consistent with the procedures and standards that have been used. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Dr. Edelman, but the state okay? Okay, so we're just about halfway through this hearing. And also, Green Punk here says the questions came from actual TV station broadcast, and they looked at local news, right? Latar County. Uh, TV station broadcasts, print and online publications, social media has not been mentioned other than caveat that social media replicates reiterated news. And also it's about <laughs> what I think the TV station broadcasts, print online, are, what they were doing with the in information from what was released in the public cause affidavit. It's like filling in the blanks, right? And saying this and this and this. And of course, you know, when families done interviews and, you know, <laughs> you know how it goes on YouTube and everywhere, Right. Um, I mean, they were mostly interviewed by uh, mainstream media, but then we start getting more information. And so the social media monster really grows. We see it in every case. Okay, things get really crazy. And so, but he is talking about actual TV station broadcast, print and online publications. I don't know. I see there's a lot of divided opinions here. I think the survey is quite interesting. Maybe even important. I don't, I don't know. Let me know. A change of venue. Is it such a huge deal? Isn't that the safer option? I almost wish they would just do it for every case. <laughs> Change of venue, just so that anyone in that immediate area doesn't know too much about the case. But then again, I don't know. People might know a lot either way. So I'm quite fascinated how many people that he said there in that survey are just like, oh yeah, he's guilty. <laughs> like, no, 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 he's innocent till proven guilty. You know what I mean? Like... I'm sure it was an anonymous survey of 400 people and they're just like, yep, they, they would think he's guilty. But I don't know. I'm always a fence sitter until I know more information, right? We don't know if he's guilty or not. We know that he's the suspect and he's going to be on trial, hopefully by 2052. I think at this rate, it's going to take a long time. I mean, it's quite interesting how they don't have a trial date at all set yet. It's maybe for summer of 2025. But here they're already talking about obviously a change of venue. Like, phew. Maybe it's better to talk about that now. Decide all that and then get that trial date going. Oh my goodness. But it's going to be a very long case, which I feel terrible for the families because, you know, it's not always this long. Sometimes it can be. But sure, this is their first time, you know, going through this. This must be terrible. Like what a long, like so many delays, right? But it's a death penalty case. So somebody's life is literally on the line. Okay. So now you can see here is witness cam. Here's the guy, Brian Edelman. Okay. Here is Ann Taylor. <laughs> Here's BK, who we're not allowed to zoom in on. <laughs> okay. This one is always all suited up. Okay. Not, don't zoom in on him. Right. 
And uh, yes, Bill Thompson, prosecutor. And okay, so this is the defense table, prosecution table. Here's Judge, Judge John Judge. Okay, so let's listen now. I think it's going to get snarky. Yeah. Johnson, thank you, Mike. Um, I mean, we'll start going backwards here, or from the back end of the Trump topic. Um, I'm sorry if your feelings get hurt about us raising this issue. I see you were almost breaking down with you minutes ago when you were talking about slide number 33, uh, oh, slide number 31. That's not the intent. And it's certainly, I was, I'm surprised to see that reaction from an experienced expert such as yourself. So I really? apologize for that. I, I accept your <laughs> He's like, I accept your apology. Is that a, do you think that that apology is sincere? It sounds so snarky. I am so sorry that we hurt your feelings. I mean, you as an expert getting so hurt by our comments about the survey. It's one of those, like, I'm so sorry with the smile. Did you feel it? Did you feel it? Oh my goodness. Okay, continue. But the idea of after working really hard 15 years to develop a credible reputation and being told on watching on a Zoom that I am tainting the jury pool and poisoning the jury pool and contaminating the jury pool by doing what's required and standard. I'm not crying. I'm angry. Okay. And yes, it doesn't. And please go ahead and be as angry as you like as you continue from your work for the defense in this case. Um, it is a fact, though, that you don't know of the, what, 400 citizens that were questioned on this survey, you don't know which ones of them did not already previously know any of the facts, specific representations in your questions. Isn't that true? I do know because they answered yes or no to the question. No. Oh, well, okay. Before you asked the question, you didn't know that. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And so somebody who hadn't heard the representation in that one slide that you acknowledged was false. Uh, let's see. Wait, wait, this gets interesting. Ooh, you see, you see. Prosecutor Bill Thompson, he brought his snarky pants. Oh my goodness. You guys are like, bless his heart. Are oh, you saying it in that way, right? Like, oh, shame, bless his heart. Like the snarky way, right? <laughs> oh my, look at the judge's face. He's just like, what? <laughs> okay, here we go. You acknowledge false that uh, Mr. Cobert allegedly stalked one of the victims. That's false. You know that to be false. Which one? Did Mr. Cobert allegedly stalked one of the victims? Yes, I was trying not to say that because. But, but, you, but you, you, knew, you knew that was false. I did. Yes. And so you have now, for anybody who had never heard that before, that question is now planted into them unqualified representation that Mr. Cobert stalked one of the witnesses. And that's false. That's false? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. And just to follow up on that, early on in your testimony, um, you testified, I want to make sure that we heard this correctly, that inadmissible or false information is, can be the most prejudicial information. It can be. Yes. And your surveyors put that false information into the minds of people who were asked that question who may not have previously heard it. Correct. Correct. Relative Thank to you. media. Thank you. Yes. Mentioned it hundreds and thousands of times. And, and just just make sure we're clear to um, around the same time in your testimony, um, I believe you testified that you don't care if the information that you put in your specific questions to uh, the people being surveyed is correct. That you said that, didn't you? Right. I don't know what you mean by correct. True or false? I care about whether or not it's proliferated by the media. You don't care if it's true. No, I don't. I no. don't care about it. Is it prejudicial? So it's okay to taint people who had never heard that information before for the end result of identifying others who have and might have bias. Is, yeah, that, is gonna, that a fair statement? I'm going to object no, to the not. questions. He's, he can answer he's the badgering. Wait, wait, wait. Let me finish uh, my objection. Yeah, it's an objection. He's badgering the witness. He's misstating his testimony, and I object. The witness testified you didn't care if the information was correct, Judge. Um, yeah, for real. So, may I just, yeah, just. No, that's okay. One person can. 
I know it's a very serious hearing, but here and there, I'm just like, what? He's just like, yeah, yeah, okay. The judge is like, um, yeah, okay, it's an objection. <laughs> the way he does that, mm, no, 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 to the prosecutor, the sin, the sin, it's an objection. Okay, overruled. <laughs> wow. Talk at a time, and, you know, let's take down the tone a little bit. Yes, sir. Oh my, <laughs> cranky pants. Okay, just so we're clear, the questions, fact-specific questions were propounded to people who were taking the survey, um, did not, after asking the question even, uh, qualify the false facts as saying, this may or may not be true, or this is actually a false fact. You didn't, the survey didn't tell them that what they might have heard was false. First of all, I don't call them facts because they're media items. And then second of all, that would be ridiculous. And no, I wouldn't do that in a survey. Wait, are you suggesting I follow up? Have you read, seen, or heard if he stalked me? Oh, by the way, if you know that, let me tell you, it's not true. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm no. suggesting. Because isn't that exactly what happens in the voir dire process? No. Absolutely it does. Your Honor, I'm going to object argumentative. Okay. Yeah, you don't get to testify exactly about that. So I'll sustain you. Dr. Elman, have you participated as an attorney in voir dire in Idaho under Idaho laws? Have I what? Have you participated as an attorney in voir dire, conducted voir dire in a criminal case in Idaho? No, I have. And just to be clear, because um, in two places, at the beginning and at the end of your testimony and your PowerPoint, this PowerPoint, you, you created that as Ms. Taylor. Right. So you adopt the, what the contents of the PowerPoint. Speaks. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, just to be clear, not every fact-specific question that your surveyors asked came directly from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? Well, to be clear, they're not facts. They're media items. They're representatives of representations Your of facts. I'm, I'm going to object. Is it the PCF? Ask, Hold on. I'm objecting and ask that he allow Dr. Edelman to complete his answer before he jumps back in. They're simple yes or no questions. What was your question? Well, yeah. I'm, uh, let's just say one at a time, okay? Listen to him answer and we'll be through at some point. Thank you. So, Dr. Elvin, isn't it true that there are among the nine fact-specific questions, that's my characterization of the nine questions, we know which ones we're talking about, not all of the representations in those questions came from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? That is true. And are you aware that under Idaho law, probable cause affidavits in criminal cases become open to the public by operation of court rule once a person is arrested and appears in court? I'm sure that's true. I'm just not used to having press conferences to tell the media to disseminate the information far and wide. Oh, so let's talk about that. That press conference was made prior to Mr. Coburn's appearance, prior to the release of the affidavit, and the press conference only referred the media to what would be part of the official court record. Isn't that true? I don't know. You know. All I heard was, this is going to be released. I encourage you to tell your listeners and viewers and anybody who's interested in the truth. By going to the court record and looking at the probable cause affidavit, isn't that true? It, I recall you saying, I want you to go to the court record and look at the probable cause affidavit. And what it did was... We're splitting here to nine years now, Doctor. That's fine. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, go ahead. Thank Thank you. I want to start with the probable cause. Quick pause, quick pause. Oh my goodness, Leah, thank you so much for that uh, super sticker. You said these hearings are cruel and unusual punishment. Okay. Really appreciate the support. Thank you for being here. And right, the, the, this was worth waiting for, right? This is like, oh my word, they're going off. Okay, so let's hear what the defense asked now. Affidavit, and I think you testified that that probable cause affidavit was spread far and wide in the media over and over again. Do you recall that? Let me be clear. 
It wasn't a probable cause affidavit that was spread far and wide. It was details taken from it, put in media stories with editorial comments back and forth in the context of news stories. It wasn't, here's a, a, a document from the government that was in the court record. Let me read it to you. That's not how it works. It's media coverage. That's how it's reported. Taken out of DNA cell, all the other stuff in there, reported within the context of a news story. So the news takes this document, takes things from it, and runs with it, spins with it, changes it, talks about it, and sends it out. Yes. Sometimes, you think the media gets it wrong after they read something? Sorry, what? Does the media ever get it wrong after they read something? Yes. And do those stories have any less prejudice on somebody's, on, on the reader of that media, whether they're wrong or not? No, and going back to, I don't care if it's true or not, my focus is to assess whether or not media coverage is prejudicial, prejudicial, and whether or not it's developed led to opinions. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. You don't say, well, I won't test all this prejudicial stuff in the media because it's not true, so I won't include it in the survey, and I'll just assume that it had no impact on people. I find it convenient to be able to disseminate a whole bunch of prejudicial media coverage, saturate the community, and then say, oh, you have no right to test the impact of that information on, on the jury poll. So it's wonderful that you get the benefit of generating all the bias by releasing it to the media and then saying, no, you're constrained defense. You're not allowed to ask questions about it because that stuff's not true. Or you have to, you might have polled one person in the jury pool a detail they didn't know. Oh, they knew the other seven details that are highly prejudicial, but it was that one that shifted everything, and that's going to lead to the, the contamination. Not the thousands of newspaper stories, not the media coverage, not the stuff on social media. It was because a survey vendor called 400 people and asked the question that one person or two people in that panel or whatever it was in that 400 may not have known that one detail. They knew everything else. They're already biased, but it was because they learned that one detail, that's what shifted the scales. That, to me, is just ridiculous. And if somebody said, I don't know anything about this case, did you stop? Yes. Mr. Thompson was talking to you about the difference between uh, in the survey between closed questions and what can happen in board diet. Yes. I, you're a quick pause. Leah says, remember when BK said he was looking forward to exonerating himself? Allegedly. That was according, according to one media reporter. We don't know that he actually said it. We didn't hear him say it. But apparently that's what he said. How do we know? <laughs> I think that's part of what's going around in the media, right? You're not an attorney. Is that correct? Correct. Well, what's the difference between what you can do in a survey and what you can do in or dire as far as your expertise? Well, again, I sit in jury selections. I've done hundreds of them. I've done research on one of your transcripts. I've done post-trial interviews for hundreds of times. So I have a pretty good idea of how the process works. Um, in a survey, I can ask those case-specific media items. Well, someone says, I just recall what was in the newspaper to the open. I can ask a follow-up, have you read or heard if David Nichols was convicted by a jury for murder? could never do that in a voir dire because you'd be poisoning the well, just like in the John Fight case, pretty much. Um, I rarely see during voir dire somebody admits a comments on something like, oh, I read this, and then there's a whole discussion and explaining to everybody, well, that's not really true. That fact was just in social media. It's wrong. That is not a normal common thing that I've seen in blood here. In your experience, 15 years, you said, doing this work, have you had a situation where you've been stopped midway through your process? No. What do you care about? What's what? What do you care about? I, I've heard you say that whether what the media sends out there, whether all of those things are actually true or whether it's a spin off other information, that's not what's important to you. What do you care about in your work? What I'm interested in is assessing if there's prejudicial media coverage. Inadmissible prejudicial media coverage is some of the most concerning. Misinformation is some of the most concerning. What I care about is what extent of that stuff has permeated the jury pool what do people know? And do those specific details generate bias, prejudgment? Again, I, I just, the idea that there can be all this stuff out in the public that's uh, misinformation, prejudicial, that benefits one side, and you're not allowed to ask if people know that detail because you might taint one person who already knows a whole bunch of information. 
But that, again, like knowing the, the, the detail about the stalking comment. Okay, that person knows all this stuff, but that's the thing that's going to change everything. And now that person's poisoned because they heard it in a survey. But the fact that there's thousands of newspaper articles and television stories and comments on social media, um, 80% of people in this community have talked about this case according to the survey. None of that matters. It's because I did a survey and asked that question. I mean, that's just, I just, I don't even know what to say. You still want to finish the surveys if we're allowed to do them right? I'm sorry? Will you still do the surveys if we're allowed to do them right? Yes, if we're doing them correctly, I'm open to continuing. Now, I think this whole thing has created quite a whole new narrative that it's almost wrong that the defense is doing something inappropriate by doing the same standard survey that's been done hundreds of times in other cases, including in Idaho. Um, so I, I don't know how people will respond because of all of this and what it's generated, but I would certainly try if we're doing the survey correctly. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Okay, so one thing I just want to sort of clear up because it's come up here back and forth, back and forth uh, with the uh, the questions that aren't true. Okay, and those uh, those were not in the uh, the probable cause affidavit. And so I think it does have some bearing on the non dissemination order because our whole purpose, okay, both 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 uh, counsel uh, were trying to protect these things from coming out to the public or to the media. That's, I think, one of the, the key issue, okay, or the concern about these particular statements. So there were two questions right at the end. Um, and the ethics, okay, of the lawyers, basically, this uh, non dissemination order is really a uh, mirror of the ethics in Idaho, especially for uh, the lawyers who are participating in the case. And one of the things that uh, is permissive for help in putting this information out to the public is information contained in the public record. Okay, so the public record is a case file that is available to the public. That's that's a lot. And so to to then say, well, we have these other issues, okay, of concern uh, that have been spread through the media, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, as you've said it. Uh, that we need to we need to test that, but then it it, it is a tightrope to balance this. So I'm just not accusing anybody. I'm just saying this this is one of the things that's pushed or pulled uh, both sides apart and puts me in a uh, very difficult situation. Okay, trying to make that fair for everybody. Okay, so that's what that's about. I'm not asking you to answer anything about it. I'm just trying to think about the solution. Um, uh, I don't know if there is a solution. Okay, it's out there, but it it does have some bearing on additional surveys. And what you're saying is, uh, if you can't use this, do uh, or uh, apply the surveys if you want to uh, complete, um, that you need the same questions. Otherwise, it's not. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Okay, so if you if you have an answer to that, that's let me ask you this. So if you said you can ask certain case like media items, like the other seven, for example, like they come from the record. Um, that's a possibility because you you can still measure what we're talking about. The specific knowledge when you ask these questions is high. These the more you know, the more likely they are to be prejudiced and biased, and you see differences in the ADA count or a different count. Now, you have to acknowledge there's these other stuff out there that's highly prejudicial, um, and we will not know if the rate of, of the awareness of those details are, are as significant as they are here. So then it's, it's an unknown. So if, if the argument is, well, it doesn't look so bad because all I know are the things of the affidavit, for example. Well, well you're, you're, if there's... Sure, this hearing is definitely quite something, hey? Most of the hearings that have happened up to now in between... They can be a little a little dry, a little dull. This is very spicy between everyone, you know, 
speaking here today. So I hope that you are enjoying watching this with me. Thank you, Forrest Nelson. I really appreciate it. Okay, so, and Koberger just to stay very quiet. And we're not allowed to zoom in on him, okay? This is unknown out there, again. Because those items happen to be one of some of the more prejudicial items um, that we found. Yeah, and it's a death penalty case. And so uh, when we're talking to jurors, we're going to probably talk to a lot of jurors individually. Sure. And it's going to be on the record. And we're going to talk about them, about what they think or what they've heard uh, in, in real detail. So there's that. Okay. So I am, I guess I'm kind of wondering too, in terms of, um, all the people that may have been called that didn't pick up the phone or don't want to pick up the phone because everybody knows, okay, that, oh, I don't know this person as my phone is written. Yeah. And I'm not, and, and then there are lots of people, including me, that would never, never. So just to uh, remind you all, it was a phone survey and it was for 400 people. Bella Italia says this hearing was last evening. Yes, it says so on top there on the banner. So we do know that was yesterday evening. Uh, thank you for being here. So 400 people had this phone survey and we went over some of the questions that were asked uh, before we started this hearing. So go back to that if you didn't hear it or just, you know, stay here with us and I'm sure you could watch it afterwards. Perfect. Answer a question, okay, on the phone. So how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you balance that? There could be, you know, 400 people out there in Latah County that say, I, I don't want to say anything about this. Yeah. How do you how do you factor that? Well, two, so you have two things. So I'm packing both of us. So the jury selection question, like I'm sure you've found familiar with these. I've known quite a bit. I've got a lot of high profile. And from my experience, asking people in a general case like a DUI, um, what do you think about DUI? And they tell you generally I'm against it. That doesn't for you know I have a big issue with that or whatever. That doesn't mean they can't be jerked because it's a general attitude. It's nothing case specific. And there's a hundreds of studies that show. General attitudes are much less predictive than case than specific attitudes. This is different and unique because we're talking about attitudes and beliefs specific towards this case. That's a whole different animal. And that's the unique nature of high profile cases. So when you talk to people individually, you still have the memory issue. You still have the recall issue. Like you will, they will not, you will not elicit everything that you're It's just memory does not work. It doesn't matter if they're under oath, private. There's so much research on it. It doesn't, our brains don't change just because we're under oath. They work the way they work. Um, your other question goes to uh, response bias. Like, what's the response rate? Um, is there something unique about people you miss and so on? So there's a lot of work on that. And one of the things we do is why we, we collect like demographic information to see, are we missing groups? Are we overrepresenting one group or the other? If we are, is there a relationship between that factor and bias? Um, and there's a lot of research on response rates. And what it finds is surveys that have high response rates where like, everybody takes the survey, and surveys that have low response rates, uh, where it's like less than 10%, and you compare them with like public opinion polling and so on, public politics, there's no difference. You find very, in, in most instances, the results are the same in surveys. So high response rates are not necessarily correlated with more reliable, valid um, survey findings. And, and that's something they've done a lot of work on because survey rates or response rates have gone down to like that. I think oh, so. Yeah. yeah, they have. For sure. Well, I mean, yeah, so it mean, could be that you're just getting. People who like to talk on the phone sure. with strangers. Yeah, and I from from this case, I think people are so invested in it, like a lot of unique things. So people, you know, talking about what's happening, they're very invested in this case. It's unique in small community. It's not surprising. Um, but just what, what what I'm finding, and there's so much prejudgment, detail, and so on. I don't think it. I, I think it's fairly representative of what you're going to see. Almost everybody in this jury pool knew about the case like comparable to like the George Floyd case. Um, the bias was the same in terms of comparing it, not to um, show him who was the one George Floyd, but Alexander King, who was another officer on the scene, like the race or some of that. So that was another high profile case that was a lot of tension and stress and so on. And we still got very meaningful data. And, and again, we've done this so many times, like we kind of understand like response rates are going to be lower, um, or there's nothing to indicate that for example, we're missing an important group. And if we were, we would weigh the data to account for it. So there's just so so in Lake Talk County, it was uh, about one percent of their population. Yeah. It, so hypothetically, if 
we say, oh, well, I mean, one of the one of these uh, counties that are interested in the can just and by this. Yeah. Uh, for other reasons too. Um, but uh, would it be one percent of the population in Boise? No. So okay, so so that's I, I was kind of wondering about it. Should we have to talk about you know two thousand people or something? Interesting. Okay, Tiff Knox says facts. Who answers the phone to an unknown number? It's a good question. I don't. <laughs> okay. Can I sort of have that? Yeah, yeah, so it's a great question. So um, you can take a small sample and generalize to the population if it's not correct. So like if you look at uh, surveys of the United States, the, the sample sizes are similar to what we did here. Maybe it's a thousand. Now you're generalizing to every city, county, and so on across the country. Um, everybody has a known probability of being selected. How you, how you pick your sample size, there's this called power analysis. So you know how you see polls that say, you see a number like 90%, and they say plus or minus 5%. Uh, so it's either 85 to 95%. Basically, it's plus or minus 5 That's kind of industry standard. And you take a conservative approach. So let's say um, you ask a yes or no question. You would say 50% would say yes, and 50% would say no. So that's a lot of variance. So that's the worst case scenario. How many people do you need to talk to so if that happens, um, your confidence interval is plus or minus 5%. It's kind of um, and that comes up to 400. So if you did Ada County, it would be 400, and your confidence interval would be the same as it is here with the small Anyway, so as long as it um, is using the general concept of a randomized sample, you can generalize that population with this. So if I take that number, and I interpreted this uh one of your answers just a moment ago about the um getting rid of the questions that are false okay that just came from the media that did not come from the uh, public uh well from the public but not the legal part um could you go away go ahead with that and have legitimate data so i think you have the nine questions so if you look at it are the other ones okay are you telling me there's two that you would like to exclude and keep the other seven well maybe um i'm not i haven't made a decision but i'm just wondering if i mean at first in your testimony you said well if we, if we can't i can't do it without doing the same questions that's it that's one of the one of the problems okay the, the, the part of this argument i mean if Oh, the judge is getting frustrated now. It would, I love stats and, um, you know, analyzing risk and all of that. So I quite enjoy this type of thing, but it would obviously to be complete, to make the point, you would have to <laughs> ask the same questions in different counties and see, and then compare the results, which I guess would be the point. Can they continue with their surveys, but they're looking in Latar County. If it's all the same type of stats in all the other counties, well, then it's pretty pointless, <laughs> right? But if it really makes a difference, okay, maybe a change of venue will be justified then. Uh, we shall see. Okay, we've got about 45 minutes left of this hearing. If maybe it can be done without uh, sort of sending information out there that is false, that might you know, affect people who are looking into that or thinking that it is, they believe in it, even though they shouldn't. Um, is that something that can be done well there's if you do it that way you're, you're there are potential compounds and things that will arise um and again I, the thing i struggle with and i get i understand the public record dissemination so we've done this before um the thing i get to is like we're not really disseminating it we're asking people know about detail that has been disseminated to the megaphone of the media so i'm really trying to just track what people know i'm, I'm not trying to pass on information through a megaphone so check it out 400 people that are talking to that the county of five, you know, 500,000 or something, like the, county, the, 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 the plus the, the risks and benefits of, of doing it that way. It seems like there's a very low risk of, of undermining or contaminating the jury pool when you're doing that versus the risk of getting a, a huge black hole of, well, we don't know what percentage know if it's highly prejudicial detail. Um, like, what are the odds of, like, what impact is doing the survey going to have on the jury of the community relative? to the media coverage it's already out there so do you ever do you ever put a caveat on the beginning of the questions where you say well uh we want you to understand 
uh, as we go through these questions that uh, we're not determining guilt or innocence. We're not uh, we're not determining false or true. Uh, we just are interested in in our uh, your answer to our questions, and we uh, want to be careful that we're not sending out something that we are not going to understand. So yeah, so we do always for some introduction. Quick pause. Did you know in South Africa, we don't have jury trials. We have bench trials. And I obviously now live in Switzerland, so I just want to look as well, you know, because now, new country. How does it work here? So they also don't have jury trials here. Interesting. This guy would love it here. <laughs> and in South Africa, right? He'd be like, no, this is too risky. Can't risk it, especially with social media. Bench trials only, where the judge decides. Not a jury. Ooh. And then just come, there's no right or wrong answers. That would not go down well in Delphi. Mm -mm, I don't like it. <laughs> Need a jury there. Yes. To any of your questions, you could always say no opinion or I don't know to any question. Uh, it's going to remain anonymous. We're just interested in your views. And so there's an introduction to that that section, the, the, those nine items. Usually it says you may have, uh, we're going to go through some items in the media. Um, you may have already reported some of these already, but we're interested in what you've seen or heard. Um, we can add a caveat to that. Like some of these may not be true. That addresses it. Some of these things were not all these media items are actually accurate. Sure, people pick up the phone for somebody and they think you know some somebody with authority maybe, and they they think oh well this is you know this is really kind of the beginning of the tribe or something. I mean pe people misunderstand all kinds of things out there, right? So you can certainly tweak the intro. Now we don't just jump into it. We don't say we're an authority. You know, it's usually you know, no. I know you, you don't say that. I just think you know. Yeah. yeah. So we, we can work on the introduction if that would address some of those concerns so that people understand uh, not everything in the media is active. But the thing is, like, I would, if we're going to say, for example, not everything in the media is true, uh, they get a lot of things wrong, you, wouldn't, you, you would not want to say that before you do the pre-judgment portion. You can do that after when you do the case-specific items. Because I, I, what I want to know is what are people's opinions about guilt or innocence? I don't want to give them instructions and then get socially desirable response in the survey. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't sort of measure it, uh, this person as their bias until you get into the specific questions, well, specific we, stuff, because otherwise... Sure. Okay. Very intense hearing. So Bella Teller says, Annie is trying to stall this. If she keeps going, trial won't be until 2026. Well, she actually said in the 20 minutes before, you know, what I had left, she said, oh, judge, at this rate, we're never going to get to trial. I'm like, oh my, that's coming directly from her. Like, probably not. Like... That's why I keep saying 2052. Like, when is this trial going to be? It feels like years from now. Will you still be here? I hope so. I'll still be here. <laughs> it's just yes or no, and you can't determine bias just from that. Well, no, yeah. So we the prejudgment question comes before the case-specific media item questions. Because then you would create bias. If I read those nine items, and then I said, okay, do you think he's guilty? I just told you all the stuff you might not know. Yeah. So the question is, do you know about the case? Then it's based off of what you've read, seen, or heard about this case. Do you think so and so is guilty of murder or whatever the crime is charged? And it's on scale. Um, yes, definitely guilty. Yes, probably guilty. I don't know. Probably not guilty. To know. Based off of what they've already been exposed to without you giving them anything. So they have no information beyond what they've seen in their home. Um, and then you ask open ended questions like, what do you know about the case? Um, and then other things. And then you get to those case specific media items. And that's when you can. Good. Theoretically, measure bias. Yeah, well, I mean, I correlate those recognition items with the prejudgment questions of earlier, right? So Correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. Yeah. So, well, there, there are chi squares, you can do different things, you can do linear regression, whatever you want. But what I want to know is, is people who report later on, they know that detail, do they report uh, stronger views of guilt? So, if, like, I'll give you an example, like, uh, if you only do two of those items, prejudgment was only 20%. So, if you only do two of the nine items, most people had no opinion. Versus if you knew seven or more of those items, it jumps up to 82%. So that's telling you, like, the more facts you know, the more case knowledge you have, the stronger your opinion is. Right? And, and that's what you'd see in the literature. That's what you'd expect to see. Um, and so. so if if somebody was being told, oh, that was just all false information, would that bring down the bias? In what? Necessarily. But you, you, you were saying earlier that it, Kind of pessimistic, I think maybe that maybe absolutely correct that once people uh, 
have a, an opinion, they're not going to let go of it, even if they get the, the truth. Yes, to that. yes, it's called belief persistence. There's a bunch of research on that. That's kind of going around. That sucks. Belief persistence, right? When you learn new information, we'll see new evidence. Hopefully, one's mind can change, right? Yes, political. And we see it right now. Yeah, like if you talk about everybody has an opinion of uh, Donald Trump, so if you're going to say, yeah, I know, but if you, are you, yeah, so. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you. For it's like, I'm not going to say it, and neither are you. Okay, yes, please, not in the chat either. Let's not get political now. That, um, any questions on my mistake? Your Honor, I don't have any other questions for Dr. Edelman, and we do have a summary for the court at the appropriate time. Okay. Mr. Thompson, anything on mine? Okay, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so go ahead, Ms. Taylor. Ms. Matzoff is going oh, to give her a Okay, just one second. I, I'm ignoring the court reporter, and I'm just so immense in this that I, I need to worry about maybe rest. Are you, are you okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, well, um, thank you, Dr. Edelman. I uh, appreciate your testimony there. So, um, are you okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, let's go ahead. Thank, Thank you, you, Judge. I realize it's it's late in the day, and I will tell you that I um, this takes about nine minutes for me to sum this up. But I do want to talk about something in advance because you're asking questions of our expert about this process and changing the process that is impacted in the United States Supreme Court law. And the United States Supreme Court law requires that part of the analysis for the court on presumed prejudice include false media coverage. It's not enough for it to be all truthful media coverage. So before you um, start suggesting that an expert change his methodology that's accepted practice, it's really important that you go back and look at Skilling and Haddon and the lineage of cases that get us to venue and what the court has to decide um, in determining presumption. The question you asked, the answer today, is where do we go from here in the survey process? I want to answer that question in two parts, by summarizing what we can do and what we can't do. We can and we need to finish the process that the defense undertook. It was completely valid. It was standard in cases like this. Dr. Edelman is an expert in this field, and he has done this jury research and this work for 15 years. Nothing about the format, the methodology, the questions, or the fact of the survey itself was wrong. You've talked about two questions that you are describing as false because they're not in the affidavit. But if you look at that affidavit and what the media has done with those things is they have created a narrative based on the facts that are represented in the affidavit. Now, I would agree that there are a lot of, there's a lot of information in that affidavit that is just flat and not true. But if we focus on where we are right now, there are representations in the affidavit about multiple trips to Moscow from Pullman and a return trip to Moscow from Pullman in the morning that lead a reader to the word of stopping that you have a problem with that word being included. Reflect back on the case law in the United States, States Supreme Court about showing false information, but also look at that affidavit and the way the media has construed that in its representations, in its reporting that is so prejudicial. Because the basis for this spin, the foundation is right there in what you are describing as the public record. Now, I fundamentally disagree that that the only public record in this case is what's there um, on the 12 page uh, docket. Um, the, the public record in this case that the entire nation, the world and looking at, and especially Latah County is derived and construed out of that, that public record. So can I ask you a question about that? This public record thing is really kind of circling around because What's what's the purpose then of the uh, non dissemination order? If if everything out there in the public is is the public record. Well, my understanding, Your Honor, is that it's the, the one of the primary issues was the credibility of the person that is out there speaking. We did not want law enforcement, 159 officers out there talking about 
police reports and disseminating that. We didn't want the prosecutor doing press conferences like we saw on 12-30-2022. We didn't want the defense getting up and doing press conferences based on the information because we have information that no one else um, has. And we are consulting with experts that the public doesn't know about. And so we have a level of credibility that the others uh, don't have. And so that is my understanding of what we're trying to get a hold of. And, and it's and it's been pretty effective in this case until this um, valid survey that happens in high profile cases has been construed to be something um, nefarious, which it absolutely is not. As you've heard, it's been used in Boston bombing, the Parkland shooting, the Colorado theater, George Floyd, hundreds of cases going back decades. Dr. Edelman's declaration and now his testimony are uncontroverted evidence before this court on this issue. It's the actual evidence that the court, and, and finally today, you're getting informed about the validity and the science behind the process. Nothing that was done is worth the hysteria and the hyperbole that keeps getting expressed in this courtroom. The questions asked, the topics, the order, the open-ended, the specifics, they were all done using information that is out there for everyone to see. And the research methods used to determine what was out there is the traditional way and the scientific method that experts in this field use, just as Dr. Edelman testified. And to be sure, the purpose of this is to give you information so that you can make an informed decision about venue. It's not for a nefarious purpose. It's to arm you with facts and information so that you can apply the United States Supreme cases that have been adopted in Idaho and determine, determine whether or not there's presumed prejudice. You know, when we first started talking about whether or not there was going to be this venue hearing um, sooner rather than later, uh, Ms. Beatty for the state said at least three times, Judge, they can't just come in here with affidavits. This case law says that they have to have more. The more that we are gathering to provide you, at least part of it, is this survey. In terms of the pros proposition that this survey taints the jury pool. First of all, you heard from Dr. Edelman that if someone answers they don't know, a second question tapping into that is asked and the process stops. There's no other questions other than demographics because they don't want to poison um, anybody who doesn't know. So for there to be this proposition that all of these questions, these nine questions that are later on in the process were put out there intentionally to poison the jury pool, it's that's just flat false. And the other point is you can't taint what's tainted. When you hear what the statistics are, as it relates to this county, 97% of the people had familiarity with the case. 79% of the people knew five or more prejudicial and false media reports. 81% of those who had heard about the stalking had determined and, and had, had took a position that Mr. Koberger is guilty. These people that were surveyed didn't form the opinion when they were being surveyed. And they didn't then go research their already strongly held opinion because of the survey. These are deeply held opinions in this community within this jury pool. The Laycock County citizens have accepted the information placed before them by state actors. It's not just Mr. Thompson that did a media report and talked about the uh, probable cause affidavit. Chief Fry, the coroner Kathy Mavitt. Uh, we've got search warrants from Pennsylvania out there in the public record. We've got hundreds of search warrants in the public record out there um, from Idaho. We've got all kinds of pleadings. This is all information that's put out in, into the media. And, and having the state now claim this moral high ground is an oxymoron. It's a complete oxymoron 
for state actors to put this information out in the public and now say, hey, wait, if you want to ask if people have believed the information that we've put out there, you can't do that. That harms Mr. Koberger. We as a defense team have the obligation and frankly the privilege of defending Mr. Koberger and defending his right to a fair trial. And in doing so, in arguing that venue should be changed, we have to show you that there is presumed prejudice in this community. And since we have the burden of this, and you now know essentially from this expert that there is presumed prejudice in Lantau County, you have to ask yourself, do you want more information to know where the better venue is? And that takes me to the next point, which is what we cannot do. You've heard Dr. Edelman say that it goes outside of his standard of practice um, and the, the, his, the um, scientific method that has been used for decades, that has been used in hundreds of cases to take your ideas about what should be in uh, questions, to take the state's ideas about what's being in questions, should be in, in questions in the survey. He follows a process, that's the process that he needs to follow because he has to provide the court with apples to apples comparison. Another issue that has um, was addressed last week that I want to touch upon, and there are two, is this concept that if we just done a juror questionnaire, it would have addressed all of that. At the stage that we're at now, which is setting ourselves up for and preparing for a venue hearing, we have to justify a venue change. The standard that you're going to be looking at, according to the Supreme Court, is whether or not a presumption exists where the record demonstrates that the community is saturated with prejudicial faults and inflammatory media publicity about the crime. The case law mentions faults, media publicity about the crime. That's what the survey assesses now. Another way to determine actual prejudice is a questionnaire, and that is done prior to selecting the jury. And at that time, we are looking for actual individual bias of the prospective juror. There are different methods used at different stages of the case, and right now, the proper method is a survey. Another solution that you mentioned last Thursday was simply to strike 400 people surveyed from the veneer. And I want to talk about that. First of all, that doesn't address the problem that's very clear that we have in Lantau County. And so if you extrapolate uh, the, the percentage of people that have uh, drawn a conclusion about Mr. Koberger's guilt, if you extrapolate that to the county with numbers like 81% have concluded if they um, are familiar with the media information about stalking, there's no prospective jurors in this in this county. You mentioned, you know, this is one um, percent, but there's much more analysis to what the prospective jury poll is here. Pool is here. First of all, the jury commissioner. I think you talked about her when we were talking about whether or not jury trial was going to be a uh, speedy trial was going to be waived. You said I think it had expanded the pool to a thousand. Am I right about that number? That I can't remember. It was. Probably maybe more. Okay. So if you extrapolate the numbers that we know of prejudice exists, I mean, that leaves us with a very small uh, jury pool for trying to uh, do uh, voir dire in a death penalty case. But if you look at the population of a whole, what the U.S. Census says about Latah County is that almost 18% of the population here is under the age of 18. Almost 18% of the population here is over the age of 65. That eliminates, you know, close to 35% of the population that's even eligible to be in your jury pool. Second, and more importantly, I can't find statutory and legal authority for you to strike 400 people out of the veneer up front. I found the opposite. As you know, the clerk of the jury commissioner pulls from the jury pool that's approved by Idaho Code. And this is a really important section in Idaho Code 2-202. It is the policy of this state that all persons selected for jury service be selected at random 
from a fair cross-section of the population and that all qualified citizens have the opportunity to be considered for jury service. Rest assured, I was just being sarcastic. Okay. Well, I, I took your sarcasm to heart, I guess, yeah, last I week. I apologize. Uh, because it was a very serious day, right? Every day is very serious. Right. But uh, last Thursday was in particularly um, a tough one. I think we can all agree. There's going to be more, more tough ones to add, I'm sure. For sure. For sure. And we all need to give each other grace. Thank you. I will end by saying this. Our defense team firmly, and I mean firmly, believes in Mr. Koberger's innocence. And right now, he's being held to have a trial in a county that believes that he is guilty. In this country, we pride ourselves on a jury system that doesn't stand for that. In this moment, I see that you have two choices. You can let us continue and do comparative surveys as planned. Or you can maintain the stay. And at the venue motion, you will hear that the data for Latah County shows a presumption of prejudice. But you will not have comparative surveys to fully inform the court. As you consider this, there is absolutely nothing that gets risked if you change venue. But if you deny a change of venue, Mr. Koberger's constitutional right to a fair trial is denied. There's only one human being in this case with the right to a fair trial. It's Mr. Koberger's and his alone. There's no legal right of this community to have a jury trial here. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm just like speechless listening to all of this. And that's another defense attorney saying, and also said it, and Taylor said it earlier, that the defense team firmly, and she confirmed again, and we mean firmly believe in Mr. Koberger's innocence. Yeah, Stefan, firmly. I mean firmly. Who's your cold cases? Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you said all the love to you, G, Mods, and the Grizzlies. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you guys haven't checked out Who's Your Cold Cases before, check it out. Wow, okay. It's just Koberger sitting here. He's just like, whoa. <laughs> I don't know. We can't zoom in, okay? Not allowed to on him. Looks to me like his body language changed a bit there. He's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> He's got his little halo on now. Okay, so we've got 50, wait, and 19 minutes or so left of this hearing. Here we go. Mr. Thompson. Ooh, Mr. Thompson. Thanks, here, here we go. Let me bring this back into perspective. Our motion. Stand by. The judge is probably writing down. Don't be. Note to self. Don't be sarcastic <laughs> with defense attorneys. <laughs> deals with the court's non-dissemination order. It was agreed to by the defense. In fact, the idea of the non-dissemination order was initiated by the defense with their February 30th, 2022 motion for a non-dissemination order uh, to prevent extrajudicial statements. That would be statements outside of the public record, which is the court record, uh, that have a substantial likelihood of heightening public condemn condemnation of the accused. And the state's position is that the fact-specific questions, and I, I understand, Dr. Edelman, why the questions are asked. I understand his explanation. It doesn't change the fact that we have a non-dissemination order that specifically prohibits that kind of dissemination of facts, specific facts about this case. Facts that include those that are not true, acknowledged from the stand they are not true. Which, interestingly enough, I look at the PowerPoint and slide 15, which talks about the American Society of Trial Consultants Professional Code on Venue Survey says, false facts should generally not be used to test accuracy of other responses in venue surveys. So if false facts are used, they must be clearly false. There's no possibility that respondents know about the case used false facts and true facts that have been publicized. We have an inconsistency there, which frankly is logical. It makes sense. And the state is coming from a point, a position of being practical and trying to use common sense here. As I listen to what we have heard today, and in part from last week, it seems that the position of the defense is it is okay 
to risk tainting additional jurors in order to ascertain bias of other potential jurors. And I'm not sure that that's the way this court should do business. If we accept what the defense is suggesting at this point. And the way he's got his hands up here and he's like, mm-hmm, sassy, <laughs> right? He's like making his points here. Point again, we are not arguing venue today. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to get into all these numbers and all those sorts of things. We'll save those for, for another day. But if we were to accept that we have perhaps on one issue, 20% of the jury pool statistically available, well, that's more than enough people to select a jury from. So it's not nearly as overwhelming, overwhelmingly compelling as I think it's being suggested here. Um, I want to be clear again, uh, Ms. Massoff used the word nefarious several times, suggesting the defense was, or that the state was accusing the defense of being nefarious. And if you're not, Your Honor, I, I am not suggesting that there was any will, ill will or motive by anybody over here. What we are suggesting and what we believe that the record shows is that this court issued a specific order prohibiting the dissemination of specific types of information, including the identity or nature of evidence expected to be presented, including the performance results of the examination or test. There's no question that those nine questions included violations of the court's no contact order. That's what we're here about. And apparently there was some miscommunication or misunderstanding between about the integrity or the importance of the non-dissemination order. Um, it sounds like today that maybe because these types of surveys are common nationwide, then the non-dissemination order really doesn't matter, which is a little disconcerting, but I don't care about what happens anywhere else. All I care about is what happens in Lake Talk County, in this court. It's far above my pay grade to go and analyze what happens in a big city or some other part of the country. I know Lake Talk County. That's where my interests are. That's where our interests are here. On the issue of whether the survey can be changed, I think that that does present some challenges based on what we've heard here today. Uh, but the solution for that is very easy. We just back up and if the defense wants to pursue the survey, they do a new survey with a new group of people and take out the objectionable questions. And then once they've done that, they can proceed to do that identical survey in other veneers around the state, whichever ones they want to select. And that would be the proper way to do this. Now, we may hear, oh, my goodness, that's going to consume time or that's going to consume a lot of money. Well, I'll tell you right now, I don't care. If it can't be done right, or if that's what it takes to do it right, then we need to do it. This is a big case. And the finger for this cannot be pointed in by but the defense. I'm not suggesting an evil intent, but the practical effect of the decisions made on behalf of the defense was to ask these questions and to create a situation that we've been having to deal with now for two hearings over the past week, well into the evening on Wednesday. That's the way forward, Judge. Thank you. <laughs> That's the way forward. Okay, we've got about 13 minutes left, okay? Let me know in the chat if you are here live with me right now. If you're watching the replay and damn, you're here all the way at the end. Thank you so much, okay? Please like and share. If you haven't subscribed yet, do so. Become part of this community. Let me know in the chat what do you think they should do about this issue and going forward. Judge, I'm just going to end really quickly with this. We didn't violate the non-dissemination order. You know, the, the information that now he's calling facts you know, it's flip-flopping between whether or not it's uh, a false fact or a fact that's in, that's in the survey. The information that was put in the survey is based on the public record and information that the way that the state and state actors put information into the public record that has now been disseminated. And we have not violated. I mean, that's valid. And Joey says, so this survey tainted 400 completely unaware locals while we comment about it by the thousands on YouTube. Yeah, I was just thinking, well, how is that survey different to a poll or discussing it, you know, social media 
It's a beast. I mean, there must be plenty of locals if they're, of course, if they're interested in the case. Following, right? And if they see, oh, this is on the local news, what is this about? And then they tune into YouTube. Oh my, the content's been going for a long time now, right? So I don't know. Good point, Joey. That order. And I do resent being accused of that. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, those, those two questions were not in the public record. Okay. They were. I mean, they came out, but that, that was not the not the uh, court, the, the, the um, I mean, where it came from. It just came out of the media or somewhere. Who knows where it came from? But I don't think there's anything, not that I'm aware of, in the in the public record that said anything about that, about your client. So, I mean, here we are. I mean, that happened. It's kind of unfortunate. Uh, I, I totally understand uh, the the reason to have false information out there, but I mean, I, I have to just want to clear that up. The other, the other questions, that's all from the public record. I don't question it. But anybody tell if you can find something somewhere in the in the public uh, public record that those uh, claims were made, I'd like to see it. But I think both sides are looking at a different definition of what public record. I have looked it up. It's the public record from the case. So that aside, I, I appreciate um, the testimony, uh, the arguments from both sides. I think it's a challenging issue. Uh, it's something that I'm going to have to struggle through and figure out uh, what to do. Um, and I understand that there's some urgency to get that out. So I'll, I'll do my best. Probably not going to be this week. So anything else we need to talk about? Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, just um, the logistics of the court's decision is yet to come. We can't continue the surveys. And we've got deadlines next week, midweek, for briefing and the motion for change of venue for May. So I'm wondering if we want to consider resetting that motion and that deadline now. I still want to keep the hearing on May 14th. We have a motion to compel already filed to be heard that day. So we could still use reserved court time to make some further advances in the case. But I'm concerned about being properly prepared for the change of venue, waiting for the decision, especially if we're allowed to continue to work. Sure. And I, I told you last week that I would give you more funds. I won't be fair about it. Um, so you want to change that hearing? You want to leave the May? We're set on May 14 at one thirty. We have. You want to keep that for the motion to compel? Yes, please. But you want to move out uh, the hearing on change of venue? I believe that's the only prudent thing to do at this time. Um, yes, Judge, I think that we should, um, based on some availability of team members and experts, though, I think we're not ready, or we won't have the team available until the fourth week of June for all of the people that are necessary. You want to just wait and just talk to each other, uh, but, you know, just, you know, have a hearing again. Judge, I, I, don't, I don't think I, we're going to have an agreement on the change of venue issue. Um, if, I, if I thought we could come to an agreement on that, I'd say, yes, let's not set one, let's talk. Oh, but no, I, no, I'm not suggesting that you would agree on agreement on that. On change of venue, I just mean changing the year, the date. I'm, 
Your Honor, we would suggest the last week of June. And if the prosecutor is ready to weigh in on that and the court's ready, we'd prefer to get a date now. Okay. Mr. Thompson, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I think it would be appropriate to reset the dates. Uh, and really what, what's going to drive this in part, well, in large part, will be Your Honor's decision on what we've been talking about today. Uh, but I think it may be prudent for the court to, it would be prudent for the court to vacate the hearing on a motion for change of venue and prepare a reset, um, a briefing schedule, and a hearing date on a motion for change of venue to a reasonable future time. Okay. To allow the parties to react to whatever the court's decision may be. And I don't want the court to feel pressured on the time of its decision. I'd rather take the time to do it right uh, than to rush things and just bollocks it all up. Well, I won't rush it. Uh, and I will feel the pressure. Uh, Appreciate that, Don. Uh, how about we set this for one third? We'll vacate the uh, hearing on change of venue and reset it for January 27. That's a Thursday, which is, seems to be a good day or just generally, except today. What did I say? June. Sorry. Your Honor. It's a long day. J June, June 27. I thought you said the end of June, right? June 27 is perfect. I, I am thinking, though, that it, we should maybe schedule for a full day. We estimated an hour for this, and we are well beyond that now, and we anticipate testimony. It's 10 o'clock. Will that work? It will. Thank you. Okay. And we're for you, Mr. Thompson? Yes, sir. We should. We, should be, we are available that day. At least those of the we who are right here. Okay. Oh, and that includes Ms. Jennings. Uh, and then hopefully Ms. Beatty and Mr. Well, I'm going to ask them next, and then I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Massa. I'm good. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nye and Ms. Beatty? Yes, Your Honor. That date and time works for us as well. Okay, perfect. Okay, 10 o'clock, June 27. Write it down in your calendar, Grizzlies. Um, okay, is there anything? Oh, yeah, briefs. What do you think, Ms. Taylor? I mean, I, I know you can't know until I give you a decision, so. Your Honor, the, the briefing schedule that the court gave us was uh, roughly about a month prior to the hearing. Um, we could try that, but if the court's decision takes a while and if we want to do, if we're allowed to finish our surveys, then we might have to have some time to do a supplemental. Sure. I'll be flexible about that. I'm... Let's say, hypothetically, that we have more surveys uh, then we might even have to push it out. That's I, possible. Yeah. Especially, no. Uh, yeah. Mr. Edelman, uh, Dr. Edelman told me that, you know, you don't necessarily, if you go to a larger population, that you have to have a percentage of it. It's just, and with, uh, I think, don't have to statistics. Your Honor, if we're allowed to finish what we started, we think from the time we could get it going, it would be three weeks. And then Dr. Edelman would need a bit of time to assimilate the data into a report. Do you think uh, it all went well that uh, you could have your briefs or whatever other information by May 31st? Yes. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, with a caveat, unless there's a, a long caveat, delay. Caveat, yeah. caveat, okay. If there's not a long delay in me knowing what we can do, yes. Thanks. What do you think for the state, maybe a deadline of June 14th? Um, so, actually, okay. I, actually, I think uh, that Ms. Beatty is going to be handling the venue issues. How about we ask her? Okay. Ms. Beatty? And Your Honor, Mr. Nye and I will both be handling that, but that works for us. 
Okay, fantastic. And then um, maybe a reply by June 20. You think? We can do that. Okay, that'll give you time to look at all that before the hearing on June 27. All right, thank you for your patience. Um, anything else then? We have to talk about this one motion. You said we'll put it at the end of the case, at the end of the day. Oh, the prosecutor's filing, yes. I'll yes. take a look at that with him before okay. I get the courtroom, Your Honor. All right. Is we, there, go ahead. If the issues that I have, if they're redacted, then we'd have a stipulation. I'll just show him what let's, I was talking let's about. Let's see if we can do that. You two can do yes, that. Okay. Anything else then? Ms. Taylor? No, Your Honor. Thank Mr. You. Thompson? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for everybody's endurance and... <laughs> Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. So again, thank you to MB Inc. for capturing that for us so that we could actually watch that today. As you know, I'm not an attorney, but I find these hearings, all these proceedings very fascinating and always learn a lot, you know, and I love seeing all your comments because of course there's many opinions here and it's great to see what you all think about what is going on here. Of course, the thing that's upsetting is delay after delay after delay. And the longer it goes on, even though one wants the defendant to have a fair trial, right? The longer it goes on, the more people can learn about the case I mean, worldwide. So at this point, they're saying summer of 2025 for the trial, for this trial. And I think it's going to be delayed more and more. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it still takes five years from now. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. Even if it took 10, I wouldn't be surprised. My guess would be like, sure, between three and five years from now, maybe. Next year? Mm, I don't see it. How about you? Wow. So thank you so much for watching that with me. I hope that you found it interesting. If you didn't, thanks for being here anyway. I really appreciate it when you are here and we're all together and we're discussing things. I'll keep you posted, of course, about this case and all the others we are following. If you didn't see my video that I put out today, because sometimes people miss uh, video notifications, you know, most of you, mostly I go live, right? So 90% of the time I'm live streaming. When I actually do that, not only do I have bloopers to show my patrons eventually when I film videos, yes, bloopers are on Patreon, um, just search for bloopers, you'll find them there, okay? Not only do I have that, but the video is out there and you might not get the notification. I did a whole summary of the opening statements of the Chad Daybell trial. So go check it out if you want to, because while I found the opening statements to be quite underwhelming, when I went and re-listened, because the audio is so crap, right? <laughs> re-listened and line by line analyzed what they were really saying. I'm like, oh, it actually wasn't that bad. So go check it out if you didn't yet. Okay, so leave your comments below as well, you know, because this is now the live chat and maybe people are watching the replay. Let me know in the comment section what you think about all of this. These hearings, I mean, there's so many. This They're talking about a May 14th hearing. They're talking about the June 27th motion to change the venue hearing. There's so many. And I definitely don't cover them all in this case. It gets so exhausting, right? And there's so many documents. And as you know, well, we're already doing that a lot for the Delphi case. Every case deserves a fair trial, of course. I wish I could cover everything, but damn. Some of these hearings just drag on and on and on, right? Yeah, speaking of which, there's new documents that just came out in Delphi. So I'm going to go have a look at that now. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Like, share, thank you, mods. I know this was a very busy one as well. And I will see you all again very soon. Okay, bye.